Hotep. Okay. Um, we are live and yeah, I will just, um, I'll give everybody time to just come in. And um, if you already watch it, uh, if you can, please um, go ahead and share the video while we wait. Yeah, but um, so while we wait, uh, I'll just introduce myself. Ren E. Imiket, my name is Imiket. And um, I have one more person on the panel today. So I'll just let them introduce themselves while we wait for other people to join both on the chat and on the panel. So, yeah. This is Tamika Harvey, AKA Mika. Hello. Hello, what's up? And uh, let me check quickly who we have. Um, yeah, we have um, Donnie on the chat. We have Robert. We have Urban Rock Media. And uh, uh, we have June Money, Gerard Towns, uh, Sen Omar, Hotep. So um, yeah, feel free to share the video while we wait a little bit. And um, yeah, today we are actually going to do something a little bit different. We've done something like that before on, on the channel, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead and um, look at some Hivatic text. And while we're doing that, um, if, any, if you're listening, anybody on the chat, just let me know if you've ever gone through um, Hivatic text, if you have, how good are you and all that stuff. So I'll just wait in case we have any delays. Be sharing the video in the meantime. So um, yeah, it's a lot of silence, but yeah, just give us another two minutes and then we'll just get rocking. <laughs> Um, so Sinet Mika, have you done some Hieratic text before? Nope, I have not. Okay, but you do know what, 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 what? This is going to be the first, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, but you do, have you looked at it a little bit before? Um, I don't know. I will have to see what you're doing. <laughs> okay, but, but have you seen like, um, uh, Hieratic text and you know anywhere in the books or somewhere before no. uh, I don't think so no okay so. okay okay so that would that would be fine <laughs> okay <laughs> uh yeah so uh we got St. Chris uh St. Chris uh hopefully you can introduce yourself in the meantime I'm just trying to share um this so we have um more people join us this is brother Chris. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to ask Chris um, if he's gone through her writing test because we already know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I worked on the Book of Dreams. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Actually, just I looked at it um, last week. That was actually, it's interesting. So did you mm -hmm. work on the whole complete um, text? No, no, no. I only got through half of it. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So, is it like um, it, it's more to do with like dream interpretation and all that stuff. Yes. Good, what is good and if that if you dream this that's bad. I looked at it a little bit. It was very interesting. It's definitely. I wonder why um, we haven't had a lot of pseudos go through that though because that like that would be like one of those things that they would. <laughs> yeah, that would be perfect for them. I'm telling you, they they would suck that right up. Mm hmm. Okay, so I'm just going to finish sharing this and then we can start. Um, let's actually see on the 
share, I didn't even share it to our group page actually. So um, if you're on it, if you're watching and you haven't joined our group page, um, you know that would be is Sashu Mani Medinetra on Facebook, and I think the link is below the video. So make sure that you do that because there's actually good discussions on on that page. We do try to make sure that um, you know we don't have people just um, you know keep it pseudo free. Let me just put it like that. You know, because a lot of these um, groups that deal with Kemet can get a little pseudo wish <laughs> extreme, <laughs> but here you actually get like a lot of uh, you know, a lot of good information. But I don't see anybody that on the chat said anything about heretic. I was asking if anybody has gone through some heretic text, or it would, it would it be the first time. But yeah, I'll give them time. So. And I might just start sharing my screen so that, um, and while I'm sharing, I can't, um, I won't be able to see any, anything, but I guess y'all be my eyes for now. I was muted, sorry. Uh, yeah, so what we're gonna go through today is just to kind of like get a little introduction to what heretic is. And um, I was, I'm gonna use um, an example. It's pretty, pretty short really, but I think it's a good way to kind of like get uh, people on our channel to kind of start getting into um, reading heretic text because we do go through a lot. We've done just a little bit with uh, actually this particular text before we talked about it, but we talked about it in the scope of, um, you know, good character, uh, Nefer Kedu and, and all that stuff. But, and then we also did a little um, one shot heretic um, um, translation before, but um, I think we should definitely kind of like, um, you know, go through heretic and I'm going to, you know, go through some of the reasons why we do need to do that, but it will be very short. So, you know, just kind of, you know, like a teaser. So um, let me make sure my, um, hmm. okay, that's what I can, yeah. Hmm. Interestingly, I might be having some issues here. Let's see. I guess I'm gonna have to just click. Okay, so um, so when we talk about heretic, we're talking about um, a particular type of script. So we know with um, Sesh Medinetra, the writing system, that um, there are different scripts that were utilized within that. And the one that we've gone over a lot is um, is the one that we, you know, we normally call the formal Sesh Meru Nature. And um, that one, in, you know, is like the more, um, excuse me. Um, so I'll just mute my phone. Um, the formal Sesh Meru Nature and um, that is, um, Okay, so uh, my apologies. So this form of Sesh Meru Nature um, that we normally go through in, uh, in our free, uh, Freestyle Fridays and in our Divine Words um, Wednesdays, um, that one is uh, the one that has like more um, recognizable glyphs. We can see that those are, um, the glyphs that are utilized in, in, that, in, in, the, in the writing system are like those of objects that are found within the, you know, the envir environments of the, or the surroundings of the, of the remit. And um, you can tell like like the one you're seeing on your slide, you can recognize what 
what is what you can tell this this what kind of bar this is this is a b um that is a dung beetle you know you, you you can't see them they're very um distinct and then usually those ones they're like um either they're chiseled or sometimes they are um you know written or drawn with brushes but it, they will be very very um distinct and you can find them like in uh, like this one where there's a little bit chiseled in, it'll be like, sometimes you've seen those ones that are raised or, you know, they have some other sunken reliefs. Then you just have like the, the basic um, base relief stuff that you see. But the only the thing that we can tell with this particular uh, script, the formal Seshmaru nature is that the objects are very, very distinct. You know what you're looking at, you know, and you'll see them mostly on monuments. You will see them on um, tomb walls. You'll see them in coffins. We'll see them in uh, different artifacts that we've gone through, like um, the Shabtis and all that kind of stuff. So that that is the form of Seshmaru nature. And that's what we've been working a lot with. And then the other one that, you know, you've also seen us work with sometimes and you know a lot, a lot of the times as well is um, what we call the simplified Seshmaru nature. But if you read other places, they can describe it as cursive. But I would just assume, you know, we prefer to just call it simplified Seshmaru nature because it's more of a simplified um, version of, of the, the form of Seshmaru nature. Like on this one, you can actually still see um, the you know the glyphs are still very distinct you can tell what the glyphs are like this one you can see could be a quail chick you have um this is an owl and you know so most of the objects are like the ones that you see on the formal then it's like an outline of that and i went through that in a, in the book um simplified session with nature penmanship so if you if you bought that you you know you see the explanations and you'd be good at um at least um recognizing the monolittles in 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 this particular form of script. So that's the simplified form of, you know, Seshmaru nature. And um, this one, you will find it mostly uh, written on, 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 on papyrus. Um, you would also find it in, in ostracons or writing boards and mostly the, the scribes or the students before they became scribes, this, the, you know, the, the, this is what they started out with, uh, the simplified. You'll find a lot of, uh, you'll find different uh, ostraca that's, um, that, has um you know student writings with with this so um that's the simplified session and it's actually it's also written with um you know with a reed brush or reed pen and and ink and then the other the, the third script and this is what we're going to be um talking about today uh this is the the heretic script and um it's like the like the simplified that we have here is also written on 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 papyrus and use, use the ink and um, reed brush or reed pen. And, um, you know, and more, it will be like written with, um, you know, red and black and, and black ink. It's slightly different. Now from here, it, it becomes a little bit different because um, here you can see, it's kind of hard to recognize any particular object. We just see kind of like a writing that we might be used to um, today. So this is where it steps away from um, the objects themselves. And then um, now it becomes more of abstract writing. And um, so that's the, the heretic that we'll be going through today. And uh, just to kind of give another other examples of the other scripts that we have quickly will be the um, thematic text, um, the script. And that also is also written on, on, on papyrus and with the, you know, uh, read brush or read pen and, and with ink. But it's, it's also now this really, really steps away from, um, from the other type of writings. And, and then from here, then you go to um, Coptic script, the script, and then, um, you know, we're not going to go through that, but just to kind of like uh, put, it, put it out there. So, you know, the different kind of, um, you know, scripts that were utilized in, in, you know, in ancient Egypt. So we have that, but this is what we are going to be going through the Haradic um, text. Now, um, so like we said, um, the Haradic text um, is written with, um, you know, with, a, uh, with a ink and a pen or a brush. And this particular text was developed alongside the former Seshbet Anesha that you saw on the walls. And and um, they were they were used like um, at the same time. 
So I know sometimes you've read some places where some there were some people talking about um, maybe which one came first, but really they were actually used side by side, but for different reasons, obviously, because um, the mediums are different. So and the purposes and uses um, kind of dictate that, but they were used side by side. And then um, this one, some it was um, like we saw, it was written on on papyrus and it was written with a brush and ink. And um, sometimes you it was written on on ostrakers or or, uh, ostraka or <laughs> ostracon. And then um, in other times you'd find it um, also like they would. In special cases, you see it where it's actually chiseled, and so it's not on a papyrus. So it's like um, chiseled on 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 different stelis, where um, or even drawn or written in different stelis, where the whole stele, um, other than the image itself or, or you know or the caption, is written in, in hieratic. So those those the art is not just for the papyrus, but it's also there are instances where it's part of the of you know of a stele, and actually other times as well, not just the some if not the whole script, but some of the glyphs sometimes would be borrowed and then put used, you know, with um with the formal sesh middle nature. So you will see like mostly like you see the coil, uh, where that's kind of used from is taken from the from this particular script. And like we saw, um, you know, it was um the similarity between that and also like the other one that we kind of familiar with the formal sesh middle nature is that it was written with black ink and 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 red ink. And the red ink is actually kind of like you see um, here. So red ink would uh, note important parts and also beginning or headings or titles. And um, and like um, here as well. And I know we just talked about, um, uh, what is it called? The the papyrus with St. Chris, the one for the dream book. And you would actually, if you see that, which hopefully St. Chris will probably go over it another time, there are parts that are written in red um, just to note like if something where you're supposed to take note, like if you dream this and then this is bad. So you see like Jew written on it. So you're marking like important parts on those. So that's, those are some of the particular um, distinguishing things with the hieratic or, and the other simplified. And then um, because it was written mostly on, papy on, on papyrus and the, uh, the medium is like something that is um, light and then it can be carried, and then um, the then writing it also. So the you know the task of actually writing hieratic is using just ink and and uh, you know and and a pen or a brush, something that people can carry or the, the scribes could carry. Uh, it makes it it made it more available to or ready to be ready to use for like um, day to day things. So you'd find people. It, you know, you find erratic text um, that are written, like whether it's a letter that is written for somebody else, or it's, um, you know, medical texts. We know about the medical texts and we know about the, the mathematical texts, you know, diff the different literatures, like the one we're going to look at today. It, you know, things that can be kept and then can be carried and can be opened and can be read. So, you know, those are the particular um, instances where we see a lot of the erratic texts being used. And then um, the hieratic text itself, unlike um, maybe the demotic and all that, is that um, the hieratic is actually has a, is um, all the glyphs on the, on, on the hieratic, like you see here, all these glyphs, they have their counterparts in the form of sesh So it's actually, so once you learn the sesh um, you know, the words, you, if you build your vocabulary, you don't have a problem actually um, transferring that knowledge over to hieratic. The only difference uh, is um, that the glyphs now become a, a little bit more abstract. So that's the only difference, but they do have um, their counterparts. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these particular glyphs and, and, and the glyphs that we see on the walls, on, on the monuments. And then um, what we can say that is kind of slightly different uh, is, is that um, between this and the other simplified, uh, let's see, this other one that we are used to like from the Book of the Dead, what people call the Book of the Dead, uh, is that here you can see that the glyphs are actually, they are, they're not combined. So each glyph is standing on its own. Um, and then, but when it comes to the Hieratic text, um, the the glyphs have what is known as ligatures. So there's combinations and most of the time, not all the glyphs, but most of the glyphs actually have ligatures. So ligature is when you have like two words are combined together. 
kind of like you see here and you'll see that in any kind of um you know cursive writing so and this is probably why i think i'll you know it'd be preferable to call this cursive as opposed to the other one because the other one doesn't have ligatures but people call it cursive we call it sesh metal, a simplified sesh metal nature but this will probably probably fit more the cursive um definition so it has ligatures and um let's see um do we have what some okay yeah like here we have um this one here where we have um in heretic this will be um the the end uh water ripple and then you have the basket with the handle but here is combined so but we're going to look at that in other places but just to quickly show you show you this is where you have the ligature, um, the combination. And then the other thing that distinguishes it from the other simplified one is that it's, it's written exclusively from, from right to left. So um, here we have, I'm just gonna show some of the you know, tools that were utilized to write um, hieratic, the tools and then the mediums where you could see it. So like here you have the scribal palette and you have um, the reed pen here started with the reed brush then it went through the reed pen as time moved on but so this is the reed pen and use uh, the reed pen and then the case for the reed pen um and then here's where the scribe would actually put their ink so we have the black ink and then and the red so those were the ones that were used and then they would write that uh, use that to write on 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 papyrus and then uh, here we have a writing board. So it's like a small piece of stone, but, and it could, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, the good thing about it is you could erase it and then start over and, and write again. So this you'd see a, a lot for, you know, used by students. And um, the students like in this part, and I, I forgot to mention that before that uh, the red ink that you see another use for it, apart from, you know, the headings and important parts would also be used by the teachers to correct, um, you know, student errors. So here you see like a student that was um, doing their exercises and then the teacher corrects some parts. But so this is also a, a media, a medium that will be used for writing heretic. And this is heretic text that is written on this one. And then um, this is um, a papyrus, uh, you know, piece of papyrus and there's a letter. So um, like I said before, you know, you will find like it will be it, it will be useful for writing um day to day stuff. So letters like this one will be written on on you know using hieratic, and and um obviously because imagine if you had to kind of like um write a letter and then you have to start chiseling stuff or you know find a piece of stone and then carve the stone. I don't know make you know smoothen it and then start chiseling and all that kind of stuff. That doesn't make sense, you know. So. It's, it's pretty handy to have this kind of, uh, you know, kind of stuff. So this is what they use to write those day-to-day -day stuff. You can find sometimes the right things like wheels, you know, they will be like, um, you know, you find instances where you see disputes and things like that, but this is a letter and um, it's, um, it's a letter containing some information about uh, a piece of land and some fees and whatnot. But so, you know, getting to know, to read Heretic gives you access to this kind of stuff like the real, I think what I would call like, you know, the meat of, of the ancient Egyptian life, which is basically their day-to-day -day stuff. Like that's what, that's how you get to know them. What do they do on a daily basis? So, uh, you know, again, to, to know how to read Haradic, you know, gives, gives you access to that as opposed to all the other stuff that everybody wants to like, trying to figure out how to levitate and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, so that's a uh, papyrus. And then, um, here is another use of uh, where you'd find heretic being used and it will be um, in labeling stuff like how we label uh, products in the supermarket and whatnot. So here you have, um, this one is like a jar that contains some oil and they would um, actually, you know, write the, the year that it was produced and then, um, you know, write uh, what is the content, the content of this particular um, jar. And then, um, you know, where it was prepared, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of just everything that you will find like in our day-to-day -day stuff. Like you go to the supermarket, if you're buying like some, you know, some butter or something, you, you, you kind of know the name of the company, um, the content of what is in there and, and all that stuff. So this is basically, you know, and you can't be chiseling things like that. So this is where Heretical, you know, comes in handy, was all, always used during that time. 
And um, another example is this one where you see um, this one actually contains oil and it tells you the same thing about what, what year and, and the content of, of this particular um, jug. And then um, I did another presentation before where we talked about specifically just wine and the, and, and the labeling format that they used. And if you watch that, we, you know, you go through the heretic, um, you know, writing and you know see how you know the how to break down all the different contents of the labeling so in wine jars as well so all the pro so the produces you know things that you need to move around and you need to keep or store or you know stock and things like that it was written in, in heretic and then um this is another example of um you know what i talked about before where you have you know the instances where it's actually um, on a stone, on a stele. And in this sense, um, yeah, usually you'd find the text itself, like in, it's written in Haradic, and then you'd have the, you know, the, the vignette and then the caption in just the form of for the most part. But this is, um, this is also, um, you know, Haradic um, text, uh, but it's on those unusual instances. And you can see here, like, um, tell you the year this is something that we've seen before like um hats you know uh hats up and then you have um you have um care you know in before the majesty or in the present the majesty this should be familiar and it's sweet pity um then you have a chenu here you know you have um nefakara and then what we used to hear like um this is where we have like sava but you know like the bar, I forget if it's like um, a duck or something, but yeah, this is how it would look like in Haradic and things of that nature. So it's, it's more abstract, but those are instances where it's actually, um, you know, Haradic is on, 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 on a stone. So now hopefully like me going through that, it's kind of giving you all the ideas and, and giving you like a quick intro to, you know, what Haradic is and, the, and you know, um, where it was used and, and all of that stuff. But so, and my, the whole point of actually getting into this is just to get more people to start reading Haradic because see, the thing is that what we usually see a lot is, um, you know, cause like I said, you know, you're going to, you know, there's a lot of, these are, this is where you find the day-to-day -day stuff of the Egyptians. And our job is to kind of figure out, you know, who those, uh, who the rematch were. Um, apart from just going through other kind of um, uh, things that we find like the coughing texts and whatnot. Um, knowing the day-to-day -day kind of gives you an intimate um, look into their lives. And because those are written in Haradic for us to actually um, get those information, we do need to, to learn how to read Haradic. But the, and, and one of the reasons why is because a lot of texts, you know, a lot of the artifacts that you find on that this that deals with um ancient egyptian culture is actually written in Haradic. you might just not know it because most of the things that we end up reading is what some other um scholars have already transcribed um and then and then trans translated so then we end up reading like especially if you're going to be reading the literature text and whatnot most of them you will find in in Haradic and and um, depending on what your goal is, for us is we, you know, we, you know, we are, um, we not just doing this as a pastime. So our job is to be able to, what we would like to do is to go through the text themselves directly to the text, you know, to kind of have like a conversation with the ancient, with the Ramesh themselves, as opposed to going through an, a middle, middleman. So you want to go through those texts. And then our, we want to figure out some, you know, make sure that what we are reading is, is, is we, we can verify those and not just to verify or not just to debate and, and, and be like somebody is wrong here, but also to be able to add more information and to update and, and, and you know, cause there's a lot going on. So we need to be able to, to you know, to have command of the language uh, and having command of the language is not just the translate, it's not the, the translation themselves, but the, um, the writing system and all the scripts that, you know, that was used to document those stuff. So we want to be able to read those directly, you know, but what, the, what I've seen that stops people from doing that is mostly because, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's more, you know, the, the, it's handwritten stuff. So it's like this, it's abstract, you know, 
once you get used to reading the glyphs then you then you see other glyphs that are like you can't that you have nothing to kind of compare it to like different um the, the different objects then it's, it's and 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 considering that there's like thousands of glyphs and they're all abstract it becomes overwhelming like we actually do read abstract um you know our writing system the latin like what we have on the screen here i mean this is not an object this 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 doesn't represent anything in our surrounding this just um a diagonal line two diagonal lines and then a horizontal line in between so the, it's just as abstract as Havaric, but the only thing that might stop people from doing that is from reading it is because there's a lot as opposed to the 26 uh, letters you have thousands to you know to deal with and, and to and to learn so that might stop people but that could actually be a good thing you know because um sometimes when you when you read the form of sesh metal nature it's like you kind of have to split your brain into into two parts where one part is actually trying to look at the, the the object itself and the other one is trying to actually use it as the writing system and see what it represents but uh Harari could actually be easier because then it's like you don't have to um split your brain in that sense it's like you're just um you know you just have those glyphs and then and and you have to know what you know how the groupings, what that means. So it, it could be easier, it could be a way to focus easily, um, but that could stop people. The other fact that um, it's handwritten as well, and because of that, um, the element of having a human touch could actually um, stop somebody because each and every person writes differently, um, regardless of the training or, or to try to write the same, they, there will always be that slight difference and nuances that you experience when, um, you know, that when you're reading hundreds and stuff so it, it's different at every time and that could be overwhelming for people the other thing is the fact that it has ligatures as well and we saw we saw um you know the combination of, of glyphs that could also be like uh, uh you know uh, create some kind of um challenge but once you know because not all the glyphs are have ligatures but once you know the particular ones that are joined together and how they look then it becomes it, then that should not be an issue as well. But those are things I've seen that kind of um, make people not really get so much into Havaric. And then the fact that also another thing is that it has um, some glyphs are like um, look the same. Like when you have um, the formal, formal session with nature, like those glyphs look like objects and those objects most of the time don't look similar. But because these are just abstract, uh, you know, characters, then sometimes there would there would be like some kind of glyphs that were used that looked pretty much the same or could be interchangeable, and that could create uh, some kind of problem. And let's see if we an example here is like um, these two here. So here you have a pod, and then here you have an owl. And you know sometimes you know the owl is written differently here, but sometimes it could be written with a sign that looks like a three. And then um, the pod also could be the same. Sometimes it, this could make it distinct, the dots on the top, but sometimes it doesn't have that depending on who wrote or depending on the damage or depending you know, on a lot of things. Um, they might look the same. So in those instances, you know, and that's, not, that's just one of those. There are some that actually, plenty others that do kind of share similarities, but knowing you know, the context of what is being written. So you can draw from the context and figure out the glyphs or you know once you know the groupings and like i said because these they have one to one correspondence with the formal search metal nature um, once you know you know different groupings of words in the formal search then you'll be easier to do that to to figure out what glyphs are being is being discussed in that particular instance where it might look like a different another glyph that you might know so that could be a little problematic but and then the other one is that um, the the appearances of the glyphs they kind of change through you know different time periods and if you look at this uh, example again you would see that um like this is the owl but sometimes it will be written this way and then so during some other periods it will be written like a three so that will change so you have to kind of be you know putting a lot um knowing when you're reading the the different scripts you have to know like what time period and whatnot but is is those are the things that I think kind of like might make people not really want to get uh quick you know readily get into that reading heretic 
you know, but those things are just like everything else that we've done with the formal session of nature where, um, you know, once you do, um, you practice and then you build um, your vocabulary and all that stuff, then things become easier. But these are the things that uh, was worth pointing out for, for anybody that wants to start to, you know, go into hieratic, just to be, from, to be aware of those things, you know, and then it becomes easier. So, um, yeah, so um, I don't know why, I, oh yeah. Yeah, so since I talked about um, the, um, you know, what is it? Um, the formal session of the nature having like, uh, having a one-to-one -one correspondence with the Haradic, I wanted to kind of show just a little example of, you know, some of those things. Like, um, especially I just picked um, these three words here because if for anybody that's watched our channel, uh, any, any, most of the videos on our archive uh, or worked with us during the Divine Words Wednesdays and the Freestyle Fridays. These are words that I think everybody already are familiar with. So I just wanted to show these words in, in the Havaric. So you see that they, there is always um, that one-to-one -one correspondence. And then you, if you know some words in, in formal search meta nature, then it gets, you know, then you can actually just read the Havaric as well. So like this one here where you have Jed in, and over here, you have it here, Jed, and then in. So you see, uh, that's the cobra, and then you have the hand, and then the reed leaf, and then the water ripple. So that's just exactly as you see it there. So the words are the same, it's just the forms or the shapes are different. And then uh, the other word that we use a lot is Iker. And where do we have it? Uh, Iker is here, so you have the reed leaf, then you have the heel. And then you have the mouth, and then you have um, this scroll. It looks like the mouth, but it usually has a dot on top. Another word is hair, where you have the face, and then you have the, um, the single stroke. So let's see where it is. Uh, we have it here. So this is hair. It looks different, but once you get to know it, then it would, you know, it's there. <laughs> yeah. So just to show that. You know, it's not like a whole process of learning. It's just once you know how to read formal search with the nature, then you know how to read Haradic. Just you just need a little time to get familiar with the the difference in the shapes or the forms. But yeah, so that was a you know a walk, little walk down. Hopefully, it didn't scare anybody, but it kind of made you excited about trying to learn <laughs> Haradic. And what we're going to go through here today is just this. I'm going to keep it simple. So. Um, we're going to go through this here. And there's about four lines of this. Um, this is the teachings of Tahotep and I picked it because also this is something that most people are familiar with. And I also took it from one of the exercise books for Haradic, which is I would highly recommend that people go through. So, um, so that's that the first four lines. And um, actually, you know, I just, realize something um if we go back to this um see where i was talking about the glyphs um some of them looking the, um the you know the same but are different i realized that we have actually here as well where you see these two glyphs here they look the same but they're not the same glyph but so how you go how you tell is the context so um here's where i was mentioning hair and then you see here is a word that we also know from this channel. And this is um, ta. So this will be the land, piece of land. And then here you have like a canal, I think irrigation canal, and then the single stroke. So that will be ta, you know, and then, um, but here you see also the same, the glyph that kind of look like it, but it's not it. But here it's actually not the piece of land but it will be um, the, you know, the doorknob for Z or Z. So here you have, um, then you have that, and then you have the seated man, and then the single stroke, and then neb, this is the basket without the handle. So you have Z neb, so like every man. So when you read the context, it kind of help you figure out, you know, whether this is um, the Z, or the monolittal for Z, or is um, the bilittal for ta, T uppercase A. So that's a good example for that one. And then while we here, let me see other things that I mentioned that we could use because this is a little bit more clear. 
So um, yeah, like here we also have um, what I mentioned about ligatures. So sometimes the words are combined and with cursive you combine that and that kind of gives it that speed when you write. So um, here you have the hand or the arm, sorry, <laughs> arm, and then the um, and then the the basket with the handle. So that's combined together. The basket with the handle without that is actually here. And um, I don't know if they have the hand on its own mm, on here. Maybe we might find it somewhere else. Yeah. So this will be the hand, and then this will be the basket with the handle, and that's like combined. And if you again, if you took the penmanship, if you got the penmanship book, you already know how to, you know, this kind, the this monolith or the the basket with the handle. <laughs> uh, the arm should be also kind of like familiar. Even even the 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 you know the owl should be from most of the most of the monolithos here that are in Haradic once you know from the simplified such metal nature book once you know how to recognize them you can actually recognize them on this one so yeah but yeah back to what we were going through so these are the so these four lines is what we're gonna go to go through and I broke it down just so that everybody can follow along and um so that's the first line from the, the four lines and uh, put the transliteration here and some of the vocabularies. Um, so, you know, just to kind of help while you're reading, but I would suggest just kind of like when you read uh, most of the stuff, try to always read them in, in, their, in, in their original script, just so that you can actually build a better vocabulary. So here, what we have, um, it starts with um, Sebait. So this is uh, the star and then you have, um, the the quill chick the quill chick um not the quill chick <laughs> the vulture is uh written like like that and then you have the reed leaf and then you have um the raised bread loaf and then here you have two words combined together two monolittals the water ripple and then the raised bread loaf so i'm just going to go ahead and read it so here you have sebait and then you have net and then you have um imi imira so you have the um the the owl and then the mouth, imira, it combined together, and then newt, and then chati, so chati, uh, and this is also combined, the raised bread loaf and then the single stroke. And then you have um, pita, hotep, and then with the determinative, and then care, so placenta and then the mouth. So if we stop there, that's just pretty much saying um, Sebait is um, teachings and we have it here. So you can see that, you know, you can actually see the one-to-one -one correspondence with those. So Sebait and then Chati. So, but here is Sebait, net, and then teachings um, of, and then Imira, which will be, Imira Niuti will be overseer of the city. And then Chati is like a vizier or just an official or in that sense. Then, you, then comes the name, Pita. So you have the mat and then the raised bread loaf and then the uh, twisted flax and then hotep, the, the offering uh, table, and then T and then P. So um, uh, by the vizier, uh, Pita hotep. And then um, here is like under the, and then you have majesty here. So you have hem and then Nesut, Nesut PT. So you have uh, here is the Su plant, uh, the raised bread loaf, and then you have the B, and then the raised bread loaf. So it's Nesut PT, and then a Shinu. So in, and then inside the Shinu, this is the Shinu, and then inside it you have uh, Is C, but we'll say Isesi. So it's um yeah, you can see it down here as well. So just to see it more clear. So Isesi, and then Ank Jet, and then R. Nehe, so given life. Um, yeah, you can translate it to like, um, you know, given life or not given because there's no D, but living and then forever. So forever will be jet and then end and then eternity will be Nehe. And Nehe here is actually graphically transposed. No, it's not actually, I'm, I'm making it, it's usually graphically transposed, but here is Nehe, correct. And then the determinative at the end. So that will be the first um, line. So this is um, 
teach, so you see this part is in red, even though it doesn't show on this graphic, but that it, on the text it will be in red. So, and that will be the heading. So it will be teachings of Petahotep, teachings of the overseer of the Syrian vizier or official Petahotep. So that's what we actually also use um, as the title for the for this Sebaid. And to go over the Sebaid is just, Sebaid is like um, teachings. We know we say the word Seba could also mean teacher. Uh, seba for uh, student and then um, seba eat for, for like instructions. So these are like instructions. And in this sense, this this one, um, in, you know, these were kind of like used in what is called like didact didactic text, where it's like they're used for their literature value, but they're also used to impact some kind of knowledge. So using them for, for the pupils or for the students to learn um, grammar, to learn vocabulary, and all that, but also to kind of like to learn good character as well and some etiquettes. And actually in this one is, uh, if you read that whole um, text is, is has um, really good teachings about, you know, just basic etiquette and, you know, good etiquette, I guess, like, well, you know, what to do when you are in the presence of uh, people above you, what to do when you're in the presence of somebody who you think is below you, all that kind of stuff, you know, so, so, but it's not just kind of like to use, like, to, you know, to, uh, for people to know what to do, but also for the student to learn also, um, you know, grammar and vocabulary and, and a lot of other things. And that's what we also, you know, should be doing with this kind of text. You know, we don't want to kind of use them to kind of just find things that you can debate and all that stuff. But, you know, when you're doing your literature stuff, because the whole point of reading literature is, um, you know, you want to be able to know like certain social norms at particular times you want to know about and then also get um, learn the vocabulary, learn what different words, what how they're used and why they're used in those particular um, passages, you know, what message does it bring, you know, that what made the person choose those particular words as opposed to different words and so forth. So here is, you know, just to go over that again, it's just the title and then it's telling us um, under what majesty so we know under what period and then if we go to the second one um the second one has what we kind of saw on this on the first one so you have um imira so imira and then Niut, and then chati and then pita hotel and then it stops here so so it starts again like the overseer and the city uh, of the city and the official uh, pita hotel and then he says, Jed F. So he says, so he's telling us this particular person is saying this. And then you see this particular word here, which is ET. And ET, we usually use it for um, talking about sovereign. So ET, and then this is Neb. You've seen the a basket before. So this is uh, the basket for Neb. And then you have the seated man. So, um, so Neb E. And then here is a good example of when you're reading the uh, reading heretic, sometimes some glyphs can look like one glyph, but context will help you will help dictate help you detect what what particular glyph is being used. So here it looks like um, the R. I mean, the R is over here as well. So it looks like that. But when you look at these words, you, you know, it will tell you, you you know, especially when if you've gone through different heretic texts, it will tell you, you know, you know that sometimes the R and the T kind of like the way some scribes write it would be the same. So this, if you try to find this word on its, you know, with the R, you're not, probably not gonna find it. But if you know, especially with the uh, determinative here and then the R at the read leaf, and that you tell you that this is Chenny, that would be a quick, a, a quick clue to kind of like um, help you figure out what word it is. So here you have Chenny, and then here you have, um, this is the dung biro, so you have keper and then the r, and this will be like the phonetic complement. So keper, and then ia iau. So this is the reed leaf, the vulture, and and then the quail chick. And then here's the person like holding a stick. Um, so that's the word iau, and then you have hau as well. So so if you read this whole, it says imira. Niuti, and then Chati, Peta Hotep, and then Jed F, and then Iti, and then Neb E, Cheni, Keper, Iau, Hau. 
And what he's actually saying is, um, here we know, okay, so it's the overseer and the city of the city and the vizier, but he says, and then sovereign, Neb, uh, will be, uh, it's like saying um, sovereign and then my Lord or my master. So I translated it as just, uh, he says, my so he says, my sovereign master. You could say uh, the sovereign, my master, either way it would work. And then, um, so he says, um, Cheni Keper. So he has Cheni means um, old age or uh, to grow old. And then Keper is um, to appear or to manifest. So if, so here is um, basically what Peter Hotep is, is doing or the whole teaching is, um, is actually uh, going before the majesty and he's, and he's asked, he wants to re pretty much retire. And so he's building a case for himself, like, um, you know, why he needs to retire. The point is for him to retire and then his son to take over. And then the teachings go over because he needs, um, I guess, he needs that permission from, from the king. And then the, it, then the, it goes on to kind of give teachings for, for, this, uh, for the son or for the other young people who are going to, who reading the text basically for what to do and what not to do. But yeah, so, so his hope, this whole particular start or the four lines we're going through is just him talking about, you know, why he needs to kind of like retire, you know. And so he he starts off by saying that uh, you know um, Cheni Keper, so it's like old age is you know is is coming is is appearing basically, and then he goes on to say again um, Iau Hau, so Iau is like saying it's pretty much the same as saying um, Cheni or old age as well, but you can say like elder or elderdom. I don't know. I think there's a word called elderdom. Yeah. So so it's like uh, you know you know being elderly is you know is right around the corner so it's in it's a ear you know how so it's like in the vicinity so it's like man you know like i'm starting to get old you know you know cheni <laughs> cheni and then keper so you know it, it's there i see it it's appearing and then um and then you know iau how like i'm you know yeah again you know that aging is just right in a corner, so it's, it's coming. So it it's descends upon him, and then um, on the third line, it goes on to say, "Let me bring my cursor." So it goes on to say, "Wegeg," yeah. So and wegeg is a word for feebleness. Like uh, put the vocabulary here, so just so you can see that. So wegeg, and then ew. Um, so what he's saying is, um, you know, like. Wegeg is like using it for being like feeble or being weak. And then ew is like just like saying it coming or come. So what he's saying is like feebleness or weakness is approaching, is coming to him. And then um, it goes on to say um, ihu. So you have here the reed leaf and then the twisted flax and the um, quail chick and the determinative um, for the, I think it's a swallow, sparrow, I don't know get the bad name but usually it's used for like negative stuff you know so yeah so um so he's saying ihu so he's being um so that's you know being helpless and um the word ihu you usually see with helpless but like in a sense of like how children are helpless so these in the form of like more like children so ihu and then hair we looked at the other word before hair on the other uh, particular text but here is also hair with the um the face and then the single stroke. So you have uh, ihu and then mau. So uh, ihu her mau. So what is saying here is that helpless helplessness uh, is um, her is something that is in the process of you know becoming um, anew. So uh, mau, which is anew. So you know he's still you know building a case for why he needs to retire basically. So. Um, so he's talking about himself being helpless, you know, and uh, feeble. So he's become feeble and then weakness has, be has become a new, or is here again. And in this sense, like I said, is used like in a sense for children because uh, obviously he doesn't mean that, um, that as an adult, he used to be weak and then now he's weak again, but as in, um, you know, he's weak again, as in the, it's like a 360 degree, like where you like, you were once a child and, we, and, 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 and uh, helpless. And then now you're getting old and then becoming helpless again. So hence the word ma'u. 
So, and then um, it continues with, um, here you have Sejer and F. So if with grammar that you know, like that would be like a past tense. So it would be Sejer, which would be like um, to sleep or to lie down. And then NF, so he's, he's saying um, he's um, sleep and then he continues to describe an adjective for that particular sleep. And he's using, this is where we read um, uh, Kerudu. This is um, uh, the uppercase X and then the D, the hand, and then um, R, and then the determinative. So, um, so you have um, Kerudu, so it would be like, what he's trying to say is that his sleep, you know, like the sleep has become uncomfortable. So, you know, yeah, maybe the bones, I don't know, but you know, <laughs> when you grow old and then you, you don't sleep comfortably um, anymore. And then the next word here is, uh, you see the mouth and then the arm and then the sun and then neb. So it will be uh, ra neb. So, um, so basically saying that he sleeps in this in discomfort uncomfortably every day and all these are in relation to him getting old and then the next word you see here is uh irti and you see this with the two eyes so irti so is um if it's a single eye is uh irat, and then because this is um two so it will be irti um and then so he says irti and then you see n and then ne, nejesu, so it will be n and then you see this will be the cobra in repose and then the uh, folded cloth. And then this is a, a, a different variation of, instead of using the quill chick, most of the time you will see a coil and this is how the coil is written in, uh, in, um, in, in Havaric. And then you have the same determinative like we saw, um, uh, where was it, here, yeah. So, so basically saying, um, you know, his eyes irti, which will be the eyes, and then it has become poor. So it's like, you can't see too good. So, and interestingly, I think it's like, um, you know, when you go through these words, you see like the words that, uh, that were used in this particular literature is mostly to this, you know, like the word nejus, nejus can actually be used um, nejus to, to describe children as well. And like we saw the word with ihu, here and where was it? Is it here? Yeah, ihu. Um, to describe, um, you know, being helpless. That's kind of like how a child can be helpless, you know. And then even the word for um, what is it? For for was uh, keder. Yeah, kederu. Um, sometimes this actually word would be like for kered. It will, it will be um, graphically transposed for keredu which means children. But so it's interesting to see how he describes um, all the things that come with old age, but he's using it, 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 the words that are being used are kind of to describe this helplessness and the hopelessness of, you know, the state of children, you know, in that sense. So, so it wasn't, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a better way of actually, you know, a respectful way of, you know, talking about all the bad things. Obviously you would probably do that if you're talking to a king and you want to really, really retire. But so, yeah, the, I, I, I found the, you know, the choice of words that very, very interesting and very good. And, and most, of the, most of them could actually be um, interchangeable as well. So that was interesting. And I think probably that was actually used uh, as part of the literature to kind of build a vocabulary of different ways of saying something, one particular thing. But yeah, so he's still, you know, he's explaining himself so here he's talking about, you know, being weak and being helpless and then and he's not sleeping very well and his eyesight is very, very bad. So, and then if we go to the um, fourth line, so that would be the last part. So then he continues to build a case for his retirement. So then he says, um, let me see. So yeah, so we have um, here, Anqui, and these are the ears. So yeah, it doesn't mean two lives or lives or whatever, but it will be the ears. And we can see that with the determinative for the ears. So Anqui and then Imeru. And Imeru is um, um, like you see, is um, talking about being deaf. So he's saying that his ears, so he's becoming, his ears does, he don't hear too good anymore as well. And then you have uh, the mat. 
the twisted flax, and then this is the hind part of a lion. So you have uh, peheti, and this is the du slanted double stroke, and then uh, the determinative. So this will not mean like a backside or anything like that, but because the determinative of a man holding a stick, we can is talking about more of the you know the power or the virility. So um, so here is saying uh, uh, the peheti, and then uh, hair. And then uh, uh, you have ak with the heel and then aku. So again, uh, with the hair here, he's talking about something that's in the process of, so he's also, here he's talking about um, his power is actually um, fading or decaying or perishing. So his ears also don't function too good. And then uh, he's also losing his um, agility pretty much. And then, um, where did we leave it off here? Okay, so then here you have, um, Wered, so wered, which means to be tired. And you can see the uh, determinative of the person sitting kind of like resting. And then ib e, so this will be the heart and then the single stroke and then the seated man. So ib e and then the mouth and the single stroke for ra, for which, which is a logogram, we tell us the mouth, literally the mouth. So, um, so he's the, the heart is tired pretty much. And then the mouth, uh, and then gere, um, ger. So here you have the, you know, uh, that what is it? What is it called for the G? Uh, somebody on the panel can let me know. <laughs> Forget what it was, the name of the glyph, but it's the one for the uh, uh, for the consonant G. So that would be G, and then R, and then a man seated holding the you know, mouth in the hand. So it's actually talking about the mouth, the mouth being silent. So ger is actually silent. So the mouth is silent. And then we have here an arm in negation and that starts um, the next line, which is uh, N. And then you have uh, med, medu. So you have M, med, medu, and then N, F. So this is a ligature uh, with N and then the horned viper. So basically saying um, not. N will be not, and then um, not spoken. So medu and then NF, which will be the past tense. So it will be NF, so not, he hasn't spoken. So the mouth has not spoken. So this, just to read the whole thing will be um, Ankui, Imeru, and then you have um, Peheti, Her, and then um, Aku, and then you have N, Wered, and then Ib, Ib e, and then ra, ger, n, medu, and f. So what he's saying is, um, you know, anqui, my, the ears are deaf, anqui, imeru. And then um, he's also saying his virility is fading, and then his heart is tired or weary, and the mouth is, is quiet or is silent. It has not spoken. So you could pretty much say the, my mouth has, the mouth has not spoken. So, so really, um, you know, so he's just talking about what, um, the, you know, the things that, the, the process of getting old and what comes with it. And then, and then after that, once describing all the processes, all the things that he goes through as a, as a person who's, um, who's old, what, once he's gone through that, then he tells the king, um, you know, um, what he has taught his son, and the son should, uh, is the one to take over for him. And obviously this is a, a way of asking for permission to kind of like retire. But I'm not, I'm not going through the whole thing. This was just to, uh, going through those first part of the exercise and just to show, um, you know, that it, you know, the process of actually going through the, the heretic text and, and going through it kind of like help you um, draw more meaning out of, you know, than just as opposed to going through the a trans a finished transliteration of the text so um yeah these are just the vocabularies i'll leave it on the screen here so in anybody watching can pause and then look at it and then use it um so uh, you will see the parts for the heretic and then the parts that are transcribed and then the transliteration and then the translation for most of the words that that you know we went through here and um 
And so this is like the whole part. So if I, I could just read it so we kind of like see what is going on. So to get a quick summary of what we just went through. So it will be um, teachings of the overseer of the city and the vizier Petah Hotep under the majesty of the king Isesi, living forever and eternity. So the overseer of the city and vizier Petah Hotep, he says, my sovereign master or, you know, my Lord, you know, if you watched a lot of the, you know, what was it uh, Game of Thrones? You know, you see all the time, my Lord, my Lord, this and my Lord, that. So you see, so he says, hey, he says, uh, you know, my sovereign Lord, my sovereign, my Lord. Uh, old age appears, age descends, feebleness has come, weakness is, is anew, or weakness is here again. Um, it sleeps in discomfort all day. Eyes are poor, ears are deaf, virility is fading. My heart is tired, uh, mouth is silent, it hasn't spoken. And then it goes on and on, it goes over, which is, um, the, the whole text is pretty big, and, but it's pretty good. And you will see the part where he's telling the king, like, uh, you know, a, getting old is something that you don't want to wish on anybody. It's just awful, blah, 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 blah. Okay, not blah, 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 but, you know, and continues. And then the teachings start and they are very, 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 very good. So this was just to kind of like give it an opening for people to go through the text, but not go through the translation that's done because you know when you when you're looking at the text itself and um going through this the script itself it gives you the opportunity to look for the word and see how you know different formats where the words are used and then you kind of draw more meaning and that's what lit, you know literature is usually uh, you know about it's not just kind of like read a book or whatever but you know go through that you know, analyze it fully. But yeah, so that would just give you an opportunity to go through. But yeah, we went through that. So we went through that first four lines and then we could go through the other hundreds of lines that are there and they're fun. So I would recommend that everybody goes, um, you know, does that. But that is pretty much it. <laughs> so if anybody has any question, anybody on the panel, just let me know. And see, it wasn't so difficult, like, um, you know, going through the, looking at the glyphs and themselves, they look, most people kind of like, don't want to look at it because it will be like, yes, I prefer to read it on this, but, you know, going through, um, transcribing the glyphs yourself and then, and then um, you know, going through the, um, you know, transliteration and translation, it kind of, it helps, it, it, it gives, it helps you and then you know and you can come up with your own translation that you feel kind of matches a little bit better you know i kind of wrote it a little bit stiff but um but to explain it pretty much is yeah the guy is getting old he's building a case on a, you know the king like i really do need to retire you know and then you know obviously you know describe everything that is terrible he can't sleep he can't hear he can't see his bones are tired he sleeps very uncomfortable you know all that stuff and then it continues and on and on and on. But yeah, anybody on the panel? <laughs> I can see. No, and then that was that was great. That was pretty, that was really good. I was thinking a long time ago we should have um, started doing this again. You know, bounce back and forth between Sesh Medunetra and how, you know, yeah, we should have been doing this a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know you've been doing a lot anyway, <laughs> on the side. <laughs> but yeah, it's, we definitely do need to go in more on this because um, like really, like, you know, when you study, when you study such, because everybody has their own reason why they are studying, you know, um, but for us, since we're trying to build an army of scribes, I mean, you know, you have to have literacy of, of you know, the text. And it's not just about telling somebody, um, you know, oh, I see the ankh here, you know, like this is the ankh. So they're talking about um, two lives or whatever. You know, you should be able to know that uh, that's not what is being talked about or, or somebody else just coming in. Uh, somebody else just coming in and then um, reading just the translation and, and having a debate with the translation and not really explaining anything you know, with, with the text, and then you don't know like where this, uh, what the words are being talked about, what they mean, you know, and because we see that a lot of people, you know, we have to kind of get into reading the text and actually going through the, in the, in the scripts that they are in, as opposed to just talking about the, 
you know, the, you know, the translations, the books that people talk about, the literature, like, uh, what is it called, Miriam, Miriam Lichum books, you see people mention that a lot, or sometimes if, you know, people even just want to appear like they're doing something, then they'll whip up an old, old dictionary, and then, you know, argue with the dictionary, you know, that's, that's not it, because, you know, because you draw a lot more by going through the text, because the way the words are used are different than how sometimes they're actually even translated. You know. But yeah, I'll stop sharing for now and then see because I can't see who's on it. <laughs> Sis, please tell me tell me that you recorded this session. Oh, uh, recorded what <laughs> session? <laughs> this session. This session, yeah. Did, did, did we, did, is, is it being recorded? I mean, yeah, it is on YouTube. And it, we are on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, you know what? Yeah, it says live on YouTube. I, I see it in the upper left. Oh, yeah, you scared me Sorry. from me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I was like, what do you mean? But no, no, it, no, it is. It is. So, um, yeah. So we probably do need to have, a, have you know, like uh, going through the papyrus days. So we could have the simplified sesh we supposed to, you know, like the other ones, like the uh, Raoul new Paretem Heru books. And then the Havaric, because yeah, people don't be touching those. And that's, and to me, especially the Havaric is like, I'm like, I want to know, like, I'm more interested in, you know, what these people were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, the quarrels, you know, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Cause that, that's what really tells you what these people are about, you know, and those you find in Havaric. Yes, when you mentioned that, I was talking with a brother today and I was trying to tell him that a lot of the, the royal inscriptions, that's only a tiny peek, you know, a look at the that day to day life of what they were doing. You got to read, you know, right, hieratic, yeah. Um, yeah. Pirate and stuff like that. Yeah. Right. Right. But yeah, so hopefully people will, uh, you know, will do that. Um, I don't know if we can, I, I don't know how to share the. Um, the link so people can join in. Um, Cause I know some people might wanna join in on the panel and then, yeah. So, but yeah, uh, so Nick Mika, so how, how is it now with the Haradic? <laughs> like something like you would like to go through? Hopefully we didn't scare Senate Mika. Oh, yeah, we probably did scare her away. <laughs> Maybe she's cooking. <laughs> but yeah, okay, let me figure out um, the, you know, how it, we can share this, um, the link so people can come in. See, I haven't done that before. So yeah, excuse me, it might take some time. <laughs> Um, hotep, everybody. Hotep. Yeah. Um, so that can make it. Oh yeah, you're a little that, below. I wanted to ask about the uh, I read it text. Did yes. They, uh, did they did they use that for like, you know, like academically, like that? Was it a specific reason why they use hieratic text? Yeah, well, like uh, like we said, I mean, obviously, because the if the stuff that you see, like the medium itself, and 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 of you know of the papyrus, and then and having to write on with the pen and the ink, it kind of it gives it it, it makes it makes it more accessible. It makes it more mobile. So, so when you need, and, and remember like with, with writing systems, you know, when you, if you read a lot about civilizations and how they start, usually, um, you know, it, it starts from a point of having to, having, dealing with trade and keeping records and trying to, con, you know, keeping records of things. So, so when you want to keep a record of something, you know, obviously you don't want to chisel things, right? Like, I mean, that would, you don't want, if it was a task, right tasking process, then it would not 
you, it would it would be counterproductive. So Haradic itself provided that means of you know having something that can be written quickly, um, you know, and then it can be written in a in a in medium that is mobile that can be you know taken from one place to the other or kept in records for other people to use. So you know, so imagine like if if you're the physicians. And then, and then you know, you're writing all those different recipes and and the diseases and all that kind of stuff and how to combat all those things and the process, the procedure. If you have to chisel that, and then you have in one place, and then you have you're teaching other people somewhere how to how to be physicians, and then you have to take them to <laughs> transport them to another place so they can read a monument. That doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> so yeah. then, so obviously, so yeah, so those kind of um, Necessities um, that the, the, those uses kind of necessitate the 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 the, the use for Haradic, and and you could see and actually because you know it's like um, with Haradic itself it's like um, we say Haradic because that kind of like translates to from um, from Greek of you know something like to do with priestly so but we you know we because that's what they saw like that it was used by the priests and whatnot but it's pretty much saying like something that is um you know for the administrative purposes so you want to keep records you want to write letters you want to you know tr uh, send messages here and there and all that kind of stuff and you know having that in a, in a, in that kind of format would be the reason why you have the habaric <laughs> and then it develops so, further from there so have they ever chiseled in the high reddit thing? Oh, oh yeah so okay so you must have walked in late yes yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, I showed an example of yeah you have it on on um, on, on Stelly so and we might actually go through that uh, let me let me share my screen real quick again so you can see that I think this one will be a good one to work work on next time so let me see I'm trying to share my screen uh, not the desktop, but so um, yeah. So you see that one? Yeah. Yeah. So that's an example of a stele, and and actually the whole of it, apart from the the vignette and 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 that, is actually in, in Haradic. You know. It's like a simplified form, and there's there's pretty much a, there's some of these that you find you find a good number of those, um, actually. So that's a good that's an example. If you, if yeah. you ask me. Yeah. So, with you know how, in the the formal the formal um, glyph writing, mm -hmm. you know some some glyphs would have like different like changes, like you know how you say. You have the the cup, and then you have the one with the handle on it. Mm -hmm. Does that goes for the same way in the hieratic? Like, would you see a one without the cup? You know, certain do you know do certain glyphs have those same different changes? Um. But, yeah. Okay. So I showed that too, but we can do it again. <laughs> yeah. But, okay. uh, yeah. Just real, real quick. Real quick. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, so hopefully you can see. Can you see? Um, yeah. Okay. So like here, um, I sh I'll give you an example on this one. So like this is the basket. This is just the basket without the handle. But then the basket with the handle in Haradic is written slightly different. So it's like this. Okay. Yeah. Or it and doesn't look similar. Nah. Yeah. No, so it doesn't it, it doesn't really look similar, but um, you know. And let me see if we have it on the other one. Probably uh here is also the basket, slightly different. Sometimes it give you see a little detail in it. Like here and then and then here, and then do we have the uh, basket with a handle? I don't see a basket with a handle here. 
But uh, other than that, uh, that is slightly different. Now, um, if we go to the, let's see. Uh, let me go back some more, uh, like here. Uh, no, that was too far, okay. Uh, here, let's see if we can actually see, because um, if, if learning the, simpl the simplified form in, in this sense here actually helps with, uh, with kind of getting to know the heretic a little bit because um, I'm trying to see if we have the basket with the handle because here it would be almost similar. It just won't be so slanted um, like more, it would be more horizontal as opposed to diagonal. But uh, do, 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 do we even have, yeah, here. So here you see, that's the basket. That's a different form of writing the basket with a handle on uh, on the simplified session of the nature. But you could find it also with more detail, like it normally looks like. Anyway, here, but mostly it would be like this. So this and and the Havaric are pretty much a little bit similar. But then and then the basket will not be any without the handle will not look anything like this. It will just look like the basket, you know. So yeah, that's the basket with the handle. Another basket with the handle. I'm trying to see if we have the basket itself, but I don't see. But yeah, so those those glyphs that look similar over there might look different in 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 the form in the abstract form. Yeah. And then others that do not look similar uh, end up looking yeah. similar, like I showed with the what is it? Um, like, like the mouth, for example. Uh, like, like these two. Kind of like... like these two. So here they might end up looking similar, uh, but they're completely not similar here. But on the on the glyph section, they might you know they end up looking similar. Some other ones too end up looking similar, like um, hmm, that are not should not be similar, like like this. Uh, actually, let's see. I don't know if we have it, but here I'm guessing this is a determinative for the three mountain with the three hills. And it looks like yeah. the, 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 the P, like here for uh, her pet. They look okay. similar, but they're different glyphs. And then also we yeah, saw this. Yeah, I those with the hills. Yeah, so, so those on the formal, they will not look the same, but on, the, on, on, on here, they will end up looking the same. And like we said, with these two, they don't look the same, but here they end up looking the same. So, so it's like a switchable thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, anybody else? Is anybody joining in? Yeah. I gave the link on the on the on the chat. Oh yeah. Uh, Sendemo says they love the personal details. Okay. Nice. Nice. Okay, it got quiet. Who joined? Uh, yeah. Uh, we do have Snet Lisa. Okay, Hotep. Hotep. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully uh, people are going to be going away and coming back next on Friday with some <laughs> uh, heretic stuff. <laughs> But if I don't have any more questions um, or anything else to discuss, anybody else has anything they would like to add? Because, um, you know, but I just wanted to get people to get more into the Habatic and, you know, and all that. But if anybody else has anything to say, uh, we can close in uh, what? Um, seven minutes from now, 45.
in the meantime, I'm just reading through the chat real quick. Um, the sheriff asked what, oh no, that was to demo. Oh, it was, okay, I got it, I bet. I bet means family. <laughs> um, and then we usually say a bet E as in my family, so yeah. Let's see what else we have on the chat. Uh, St. <laughs> Sean said erotic is now my to-do list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and definitely get the book. Um, you know, it kind of, you know, talks about the penmanship, talks about the scribal. And actually, you know, like uh, speaking of the scribal, um, you know, the education for being a scribe, um, you know, because everything, uh, revolved around documentation and all that stuff. So um, scribes are pretty much very important in, in that society. And uh, actually scribe is, is like the point where people start. So you start your schooling and then once you graduate, you become a scribe. Now, once after becoming a scribe, then, um, you know, the students could move on to other things. And then, you know, you could work under some apprenticeship uh, work where it's like you're working under somebody. And then, and at that time, when you graduate, you're called a sesh. And then when you're working under somebody, you become um, like a heri a, which is to be under the arm of somebody, basically, pretty much like literally. So, you, so you're being um, taught by somebody else where you could move on to, to take on different, um, you know, further your skills. And then that's where you find other people working as a teachers, working as, you know, uh, the sesh could be like uh, the ones who would be like working on monuments and things, but everything starts from, learning how to write and not just to write, but learning the writing, learning the characters, you know, the, you know, the good character and uh, good speech, which you be uh, with uh, Nefermedu. Yeah, so uh, eloquent speech and good character and then literacy and literacy, which people kind of like uh, misuse nowadays is, you know, you have to be good at uh, li being literate. Actually, means uh, being uh, being able to read and write. Now, some people would be like they just read the translation, but if you're going to be um, a scribe or you're taking it seriously, you have to know how to read and and how to write. So you know, read the sesh and write the sesh. You know, <laughs> scribe by day, recite by night. You know, and and all, all of that good stuff. So we kind of recommend that. And I have a book that kind of teaches you the all the first volume is um, goes through the technical bits of of, of um, writing and because in this case is a writing that is actually um, what would be considered a drawing but you you know but you know how do you write without literally drawing because most people would be thinking you know like I'm not I can't I can't draw so I can't write such but you can so it's just breaking down all those um, you know the technical beats that will get you from not being able to, to, to not being an artist to being a, a sesh, because you can actually write uh, a sesh metanature. It's not like drawing, you write, you know, but there's a certain way of thinking things and, and approaching um, the glyphs that makes you be good at actually writing it, even though you might not consider yourself um, good at drawing. So the first volume goes through all of that, the technical bits, and then um, the second and the third volume, which will be coming, is a, have a different focus. But by the time you finish, you'll be good at writing um, all the simplified forms. But yeah, get the book. The link is put is on the on the on the chat. <laughs> hey, ETM Hotep, Hotep, everybody hear me? Hotep. All right, all right. I'm I'm extremely popping in real late. Okay, yeah, very late. <laughs> so you want to um, repeat everything you said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we didn't record it like St. Chris was saying. No. <laughs> nah. Yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, yeah, summary, we just went over uh, the first four lines of Pata, uh, teachings of Patah Hotep, where he was uh, laying on thick for the king, like where well, I need to retire, like all the terrible stuff happening to my body, you know, all that good stuff. And uh, we went through that. And then we also looked at different Haradic texts, uh, uh, you know, and how they were used in what formats in, you know, the different uses. And so everybody now is a Haradic expert. Okay, all right. Okay, so I guess they, that's it, huh? <laughs> yeah, unless, uh, do you have any questions or would you like something you want me to go over? <laughs> uh, freestyle, some erotic, whatever, you know, we stay ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, I'm saying I don't I don't know what you went over, so I don't want to have anything repeat. But if, if you did go over this, I just want to emphasize something that um, a lot of a lot of text, a lot of information that we know about the um, the life and culture of Kemet comes by way of texts that are written in hieratic, what what scholars call hieratic. And when you learn when you're learning this language you learn the formal um, script first, then you move on to hieratic. And, you know, some people would like to learn hieratic for the simple fact that, you know, there's a lot of documents written in hieratic. Uh, you want to learn that first, but it's always, it's best to go the, you know, the way that it's taught now, which is you learn the formal glyphs and then you learn um, hieratic. And it's really no different than elementary school when you learn how to write uh, manuscript or script i mean um print and then you learn cursive later on and that's the that's the same thing but in ancient times though it was in reverse they they would write in hieratic and practice 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 and then they would learn how to carve because to actually chisel and carve the way that the way that they did took extra skill so we're we're working in reverse because we are observers and we're not those who are um creating this. And so that's the easiest way for us to learn it. You know, I've I've had a lot of people um in in the process of teaching this for for as long as I have uh, a lot of people want to learn hieratic or wonder if they, you know, should learn hieratic now and stuff and I would just tell people to um you know kind of be patient with that with that part. And I've had instances where people would, you know, jump the gun and want to learn hieratic. And then, you know, after some time goes by, months and months go by, they, they realize it and they come back and, and say, well, hey, you know, let me do what you said. Right, because uh, the example that I was showing where it's like, um, you know, showing those one-to-one -one correspondences, you see that um, it would actually be easier going, you know this other way we're doing it first because you kind of have to know those words like uh, the patterns the groupings because once you know them and then you can just transfer them over to Havaric as opposed to you know getting some a, a whole new script um, you don't know what sign is what sign and what it means and then there's plenty of them thousands of them at the same time that's like it will take you years and you just it's kind of like you know those I give an example of when people buy new equipments and then and then, you know, you want to bypass the manual and then you go doing stuff and then because you think, you know, and then after that, you have to start the whole process again, <laughs> you know. So that's what will happen if you do if you do it the other way where you stand the Havaric first. But, you know, it's good to kind of get familiar with those glyphs in the formal first and then just transfer them to Havaric after. Yep. And um, another thing is that a lot of texts that people, you know, show and read they were actually transcriptions from hieratic to the sesh sesh meter nature so a lot of people are actually reading they think they're actually reading a primary but they're not and it's only you know it's only a few um i mean not a few but it's there's only um certain cases that that's true so um there are transcriptions from hieratic into the formal glyphs and then that's what's mostly published 
So in a lot of publications, you won't see hieratic. You'll see a transcription of hieratic into the formal Seshmeter Netcher. And so we take it another step and we want to make sure that we get the actual primary or the actual hieratic and then do our own transcription. Because I found personally, I found that um, scholars, well, we know that all scholars have the potential to make mistakes. Everyone can make a mistake. And, you know, you would think scholarship kind of goes through the filtering process to where it keeps mistakes to a minimum. And that's very true. That's part of scholarship. You know, you, you escape, um, mistakes will, will creep in, but they're kept to a minimum. But those mistakes that have crept in, sometimes it can make a difference depending on what you're looking for, what you're studying. And so I've, I've found a few mistakes in transcriptions uh, from, uh, from hieratic to Sesh Metternetcher. And so, and that was a while back. And ever since I, I stumbled across that a few times, it made me see the importance of, you know, doing, being able to do this work yourself if it becomes necessary. You know, we don't have to do that for everything, but when it comes to a question of um, being sure and, um, there's something that's that's a little odd going on. You want to be able to do this kind of work to to see it yourself. So it's always good to get that actual primary. So the hieratic, um, like the maxims of Patahotep, get the actual hieratic and you know, learn through it. But that's so popular that you know you probably pretty much won't find um transcription transcription mistakes in that because a lot of people have dealt with that but these more um obscure writings you definitely want to be on guard yeah i remember uh watching the other shows with uh you guys you asa uh and uh, jonathan uh going over uh different stories and most of the time it would be like uh you, you would you guys would note like some errors on on some other translations that that were already done that you guys were going through so I think that's that's the first the first time I actually saw and know and realized that the most of the time things that people use out here can actually have errors. So and because you guys like were proficient in it, you could tell like uh, where the errors were coming from and why, you know. Yeah, and like I said, it's it's not too many of those cases, but when you run across it, you want to be able to solve you know, have a solution for it. So yeah, but hieratic is the actual next level. In terms of teaching, in terms of curriculum wise, hieratic is, like I said, comes after learning the Sesh Metanetra. Sesh Metanetra is a beginner's level, learning the actual writing system, how it operates. But that's in Sesh Metanetra. So that's, that's the formal glyphs and the simplified. And hieratic is actually simplified. I know you, you definitely, um, I'm sh quite sure you mentioned this, that hieratic. Uh, well, I don't know if you went over this, but how did hieratic get its name? Oh, yeah, with the, because of it was with the priestly, uh, they saw it with the priest texts and all that from the Greek for priestly. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I'm saying you, you, went, you already went over that? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, um, but you could, you could expound on it a, a little bit clearer. Okay. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Okay. So, well, probably, I'm probably repeating what you already said, but, um, the hieratic is really a, um, slight misnomer because it, of what it means, it means the priestly writing. And so people are under the impression that hieratic was used by priests for religious purposes only you know seems it makes it seem that way that's the implication but hieratic was used alongside the formal session nature pretty much since it was invented um long ago they were pretty much neck and neck running side by side so it wasn't used for strictly religious purposes or strictly by priests it's just that clement of Alexander, who was, who was the one that's responsible for naming these, 
um, during his time when he was in Egypt, that's what he witnessed. So therefore he described it that way. And we have all of that information in the rebuttal um, book where we speak on that. But, um, but I'm saying it because hieratic is only named because the priests used it, not because of the style. And people are in the impression that that's true and that's not true either. All right. So, um, it actually be called the essential uh, script, considering uh, as translating uh, the priest that people translate now as things like wab and all that as priest, but we say like essential worker. So it could actually be using that, we could say it's an essential script, <laughs> which is actually what it is because that was for the essential stuff, the day-to-day -day stuff. So the proper word would be essential probably <laughs> to translate priest correctly. <laughs> right, essential worker. Like, like now during the pandemic, when they said essential workers, um, you know, people were, were advised to um, distance and stay home and stuff like that, except for essential workers. Well, if this was ancient times, the people we're calling priests would be those people who did not stay home. <laughs> they would be essential workers that had to do what they had to do. You know, that's what a priest actually is. You know, you take it out of the context of the of the uh, Catholic Church and and all of that stuff. That's what a priest actually is, an essential worker, a person with very important job. All right. That's pretty much what a priest was. Uh, but to the script, though, um, it simplifies Seshmet and Etcher. And, you know, so I'm sure you went over it. So I don't I don't want to repeat anything you've already gone over. But if you compare side by side the formal Sesh with the styles that scholars have lined up and called the um, hieroglyphic, the cursive hieroglyphic, and then hieratic, and then demotic, and then coptic, those are all labeled as writing styles or systems by scholars. But we, if you line them up um, outside, you know, coptic is obviously going to be different because it uses the Greek alphabet for the African language uh, that's also called Coptic. So Coptic is a language plus it is also the name for a script. And that script is a Greek script being used for the African language of, um, of Coptic. Um, but the foremost, uh, what they call hieroglyph or hieroglyphic and the cursive hieroglyphic and hieratic, if you line those up, you can still pretty much see that it's, it's just going through a process of simplification. It's being more simplified. And that is it. It's the same as English uh, writing where we have print and cursive. If you line up a um, printed word and then the cursive, same word in cursive, you can see how it, it just transitions. And that's pretty much what it is. Now, demotic is where is that is that hybrid where you get that you definitely lost any semblance of the pictorial nature of, of the glyphs but hieratic is still there a bit you know to the trained eye you can still see that so there you have it but it's kind of quiet i don't know no, i'm just listening oh, oh yeah right. but that's a good summary Left out. No, we can hear you. No, I'm saying I, I don't know if people, if anybody else was in here. Oh, okay. All right. So, I mean, yeah, I don't want to long, long it out, as they say. I don't want to long it out. I, yeah, yeah. I do want to say this. Uh, I know this is at the end, end of this video, is that, um, you know, I, I received a few inboxes today or tags to a couple of posts where, and, and you know, I've asked on these shows, we've asked people for um, topics that they would like for us to go over, you know, and so I guess a few people have um, taken us up on that offer and given us a few topics, but they aren't quite the topics that I was thinking of when I asked the you know asked the uh the question because because mainly what I've been getting is people want us to address 
claims that other people ha- are making. And and that's fine too, but you know, I want to I want to mix it up. I want, you know, topic conversation topic topic driven um discussions about, you know, the language or the culture or things like that. But uh, you know, it's 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 okay to address people's claims also uh if a teaching moment can 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 be made out of it but not just for the sake of because i'm not going to chase down every claim you know um that's why we have a couple of articles on the website already that dealt with popular claims you know the aliens the spaceship thing light bulb thing the um the word hotep uh, we dealt with quite a few um claims as far as as far as popular ones um and a, and a real hot one was that the that the glyphs were never deciphered so we had to we had to say hey this, this is not an article this is this is a book but there's there's claims that people are making that you know i've been tagged in in or inbox want to address and i know one you know and it's and it's mainly whatever's being going whatever's going on on social media platforms at, at the present moment, like whatever's going on now or at the present is what people will ask about and want us to address. So we may do a few of them, but I'm just letting people know that we're, you know, not, we're not in the habit of chasing every claim down just because somebody claim it because a lot of, some of these claims are so um, nonsensical or kind of ridiculous that, you know, it's not really worth it to 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 um deal with it and for those who may think it's um a valid claim or a truthful claim accurate claim um you know i i you know sometimes we have to kind of choose which ones to, to deal with because it can't chase down and deal with everything because if that's the case then people will just make any claim then we you know, we got to address it you know that we'll 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 be working for for that you know uh, be a, there'd be a nine to five job. So anyway, I'm just, I guess what I'm saying is that a couple of them will will address any ones that that can be made into a teaching moment, like like the uh, slavery and Kemet issue with the word Sekir Unk. Um, we should know by now that that word does not mean bound for life. So if anybody is still continually going around saying that, then they intend to mislead you. Period. All right. There's no um, there's no way around that because you have people who are not learned in a language and pretend that they're learned in a language and will make claims and then stick to those claims and not consult or deal with people who are actually learned in the language and listen. And for whatever the reasons are. And so those people um, after, you know, time goes by if that if, you know if that continues then you know you have to look at their intentions and it's not it's not real scholarship it's this is just um playing you know playing the game of fussing and just having you know trying to win you know win uh an argument based on what do you call it popularity and not accuracy so that's a couple that, you know, I spoke about Sekir, the word, the phrase Sekir Unk and how it does not mean bound for life. Um, and there's, you know, there's a couple of more. Uh, oh, another one. Well, I'll just tell you the recent one that someone asked me about, which has made me think about all this, is the word um, Unk being the same word as the word Inky or Unky being the same word as Inky. That's false. And anybody who believes that, shame on you. And anybody who teaches that, shame on you. And it's just not true. Um, that's not how you do linguistics. Linguistics, you know, comparative uh, linguistics is a totally different um, thing. It takes a lot of rigor and it's more of a scientific process of logic. And if, if we started to just call off any words that sound somewhat similar to other words and say that they're the same and this and that, just to, just to argue or, or to, um, or to drive an agenda or an intent, then we're doomed and we can't do that. But 
that's you know a recent one that somebody inboxed me and asked me does the word unki is the word unki the same as the sumerian or um akkadian version of uh enki i can't believe that like man no right so that's just not true the words that sound like i mean do you know how many words we, we refer to that as homophones homophones are words that sound alike but they're different like the word two is is a very popular homophone uh there's three words two 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 t-o-2 t-o-o-2 and then t-w-o-2 they all sound alike but they're three different words three different meanings three different usage usages um and there's there's a, a long list of those in every language and cross languages, not only not only within one language, but across languages. Like the English word shit. That's that's in English. That's a curse word or was referring to, you know, whatever negative and everything foul language. But it's an actual word in other languages that sound like that. Yeah. You know, uh, um. So homophones, and one thing about homophones dealing with ancient Egyptian language is that we really don't know what would be a homophone because we don't know how the words were actually pronounced historically. The vowels are not recorded in the writing system. And so all of the pronunciations that we do are purely conventional. The word unk and its um, derived form, uh, nisbi or relational adjectival form, unki, it may not have been pr historically pronounced like that at all. And so to say that that word is the same word as enki is really just ridiculous. Sumerian words are not even built up the same way. It's an agglutinative um language you have n key unki is not built up that way the word unki is actually a relational adjective you know from the substantive unk unki one pertaining to life and we just simply short it to living one the living one usir or osiris has an epithet of unki because he is the living one and and he's called this because of certain things that transpire in the stories um, related to him. He's actually the one whose rotting body sheds and the stench from, the, from his decaying and rotting body is actually what, what fuels Kemet. The Nile, the inundation, his sweat, his, um, the breaking down of his, of his corpse and all that kind of stuff. And Usir is likened to the deceased king in, in a similar process. A person who regenerates and who is now a living one. So he receives that, 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 that um, epithet or title of a living one. Has nothing whatsoever to do with Enki, the son of Anu, the brother of Enlil. Or the Anunnaki of the Sumerian pantheon or the Akkadian version of that. Anyway, so that's just an example. I'm just saying, so, you know, that's what's going on out here. And, you know, we got to take this a little bit more serious and um, not make a microwave, make a joke out of it. And then don't make the whole, don't make the, the intellectual community look bad. You know, we can't do that for the sake of whatever, you know, whether it's, um, attention, clout, likes, um, subscribers, uh, friend requests, whatever it is, it's not worth it. All right. So we got to get on the ball, stay on the ball. Yes. Uh, I got a question like outside of the slavery kind of claims. Um, I understand that language came before uh, the writing, before the writing system. Right. I heard that uh, 
I heard that a today that you know the writing system was kind of made to people wanting to count count their slaves or something across that line. Wait, wait. Say it again. Yeah, they wanted to. They wanted to record, record, record their slaves. So they kind of made the, a writing system to record things that they gather. Wait. So you're saying that writing was invented to record slaves? Like it was first used in that way. Yeah. To record, you know, whatever they collect. Nah. And it. Okay. <clears throat> No. That's what I heard. But I was like, that's gonna be the I've heard a lot of things too, but I mean, you know, people make up stuff all the time. And see, we we have to we have to become a culture. See, this is man, this I is mean, a I don't know why they're so prone to like having people, you know, something to subject to them being in slavery all the time. Kind of confusing. Well, we better, we better, um, folk, we better, you know, what do you call it? Uh, promote a culture or an environment where people have to demonstrate. Demonstration beats conversation. And we have to be, see, people talk about scientific literacy and, and STEM and all that stuff. But they talk about it like as at a distance and not really realizing that it's not so much the fields of study that fall under STEM, but it's actually the mode of thinking that produces STEM. So math is the domain of logic and science is the domain of evidence. And we, we need to promote the need for logic and the production of evidence for all, for all the things that we, we think we know and, and, and profess to know. If somebody professed to know something, there's a consequence to that claim, to professing that. Show evidence. How do you know that you know? And science provides the tools of discernment to know when we know something. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and it bears out in evidence. You have to have evidence. And then within evidence, you know, there's different weight of evidence the different types of evidence have different weight eyewitness testimony is very 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 minimal in weight it's the least in science but it's but in the, in the court system it's is very high on the list of weight it has heavy weight but in science you don't care about anybody's eyewitness testimony because our, our, our human senses, the five senses, can fool us. And we know that. It's very frail, very, very, um, uh, what do you call it? Handicapped. We're handicapped. Our senses. We, we could see things not there, hallucinate, optical illusion stuff. We could hear things, whatever, think we hear something, all that kind of stuff. So it goes way beyond that. So, I'm, I mean, I'm saying that to say that when people make claims, or when they say claims like that, they have to show the evidence. But, but I mean, to address that, though, the writing, um, obviously, speech was way before writing. And what we tend to take for granted is that um, without writing, the people had to, human beings had to have a way to store knowledge in some kind of form. And they stored it in literary form. I mean, not literary form in writing, but in oral form and with the way they communicated. So they stored information within how they spoke. Whereas today we store information in writing, which, which is totally different. And we take that, we take that, that, that change for, for granted, you know, and writing was was invented for the reasons of you know record keeping so in that sense you know that's why i said is it particularly the slave slaves or something or whatever now but if you if you look at the early writing um attestations it always has to do with something with um like commerce trade and mm -hmm. commerce so you look at um 
you look at Abju, the Abju discovery for the early, earliest, probably the earliest um, form of, of a writing system uh, in Abju, Abydos, as they say, um, in Tomb J, I believe, Gunter Dreyer and his team discovered these um, ivory tags that used to go with certain goods. And it was inventory tags. And so they were recording things uh, that they had in surplus and stuff like that. So to that extent, that's um, that's correct. But if people want to tie connect slaves and stuff in there, then, you know, that's that's a, that's a big that's a huge spin on that. It's ridiculous. Because those ivory tags don't even have anything to do with slaves. The oldest ivory tags. So, I mean, people just say stuff, you know, so now. Nah. So, yeah, it's weird, like the kind of stuff that people come up with, like, it's just like some of these things you don't even have to, like, uh, think so hard. It's just you, like you'll be like you hear them and you're like, yeah, it's a joke, really, you know. So, like, those, those are really crazy. Some kind of like oppressive syndrome. It's like people are bored or something like, I don't know. <laughs> like if I was trying to find something, I would, I would go for some very interesting and challenging stuff. You know, like you, if you want to keep yourself busy, you know, you know you try to find something that would be like, give you a good challenge as opposed to just making up stuff. And then, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And um, one thing about this, um, I see the comment, Dasharab uh, says writing start off Writing started off marking animals and water wells. Um, one thing we have to understand is what is writing and what is the demarcation to say, okay, that is writing versus that is not writing. And, and a lot of people mistake, um, you know, um, pictographs of themselves, picture writing as writing. And that's like an oxymoron to say picture writing because pic pictorial um uh, you know, pictograms in and of themselves, that's not writing. You know, writing is actually the visual representation of speech. And so just because people draw, you know, a, a picture of something, that's not writing. And that has to be, you know, clarified and, and distinguished. All right. And people have to understand it. And we, and we talk about all of this in, in our book. Um, has the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing system been deciphered a rebuttal to Walter Williams? We put all of that in the book because it was necessary for us to define writing so that we can explain to people how the Seshmedu Netra is a writing system and it, it, that it was deciphered. Okay. And people confuse decipherment from trans translations and, and all kinds of things. So we clarified all of that stuff in the, in the book. All right. So, you know, so I want to make sure everybody understands those differences. But yeah, we have to really, really um, watch, watch that. And, and, you know, you know, you can't, obviously you can't stop anybody from, um, you know, giving their opinions and stuff like that. That's fine. But sometimes it gets to the point where the people have to start um, changing the landscape. You know, I I want to I want to start seeing more people ask for evidence of claims. You know, not just to ask because you know one thing we we also don't want to do is, and I'll give you an example. Um, as people jump on the bandwagon of of being more scientifically literate and and they see and they see the push for that, you have people, and then you know, in research and methodology. You have people that will demand um, sources and they'll tell people to source up, give me a source, show me a source. And, and that is fine, but people take that as if that's it. And, and, you know, we have to remind people that if I make a claim and then you ask me for a source and then I'm able to show you a source, that still doesn't make my claim correct. Unless I'm claiming that I have a source, <laughs> then then obviously if I show you a source, then that that is an accurate claim because I, I claim 
that I have a source and then I produce a source. Therefore, I'm accurate and I'm correct in my claim. But in terms of the content and all of that good stuff, just because I find somebody else to agree with me or say the same thing that I say does not mean that I am correct. That's a form of appeal to authority, which is a logical um, fallacy. You know, so we have to be mindful, um, mindful of that. And so people need to start asking for evidence of these things, but not just for the sake of asking. We got to understand how that works. You know, the burden of proof is always on the claimant. Always on the claimant. Whoever's making the claim, it's their responsibility to demonstrate support for that claim. That's 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 argumentation one on one. All right. And so anybody making a claim, and then and so here's the thing too. I see people will make a claim and then try to show support, and to a to an unknowing audience they may think the person is actually supporting the claim and and they're not and so in scholarship in general what what keeps that at bay is the peer review process you know when you make a serious claim you know you submit your claim and run it through the fire of of your peers who will put their eyes on it and then so on and so forth. That whole peer review process. And people think peer review is the end all be all as well. You can get your stuff reviewed and it'd be wrong. Just because your peers viewed it, um, you know, that doesn't make it right either. The strength of ac accuracy, listen, accuracy is all into uh, what you can demonstrate. And what cannot be falsified? What's attempted? What is falsifiable, but is but is unsuccessful at doing so. But anyway, I, I know I'm about to um, ramble on. Uh, yeah, but no, he uh, students can peer review each other, right? <laughs> yep. So yeah, so peer review that you know, yeah. Because I, I noticed the word peer review, uh, source up. There's a lot of words and phrases that are being thrown around lately that really doesn't explain or has the value that people think it does, you know? Right. Like kind of the, they, get, they do get misused a lot because you can, you can find sources. You know, I mean, pseudos, there are like docu documentations of pseudo stuff as well. So you could definitely find sources of pseudo stuff i could show you a source where um the aliens built the pyramids right exactly <laughs> yep i could show you sources on that yep i can show you sources on a lot of things that are just not true i can show you sources for um santa claus so that's not it you know is that's not it but anyway so you know um you know, some things that we could take the, a teaching moment out of and everything. We'll start addressing some of those things. Uh, like before, we had a Sabite Dome series of videos where we would take some claims and convert them into teaching moments. But I'm just saying this for the record, though, because we ask for people to give topics and appreciate them. But we're not going to chase down every claim. You know. We're just not going to do that now. It'd be yeah. nice to be able to do that, but no, nah, it's not. That's not going to happen. I've I've heard. Look, within the last two weeks, I've heard claims that man. I've heard a lot of claims just that I know is just not true, but they're just so really kind of just crazy simple. But there's people out there that believe it. People out there that believe it. You know. So, can't take down everything. But you know what? I might, I may just ask for people to to um 
to to like submit claims though and then you know and then we could look through them and see which ones are are you know kind of good enough to make teaching moments out of might might do that claims that may, may think is uh, has some merit to it and someone may seem ridiculous but i got a few recently so i i, I could tell the youtube streets have been busy because you know people come to me because i don't i don't get involved with the with the noise so they come to me you know wanting to answer things and the unki one was one the slavery in egypt was another one um what was the different one what was another one it was another one um oh you know the egyptians the, the true egyptians come from the south are the egyptians black um oh is was seer a real person that's one because they found his tomb do y'all remember that remember that what was that 1990 that was the 1990s i think geraldo or 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 maury povich one of them had a special and they went all the way over to egypt because for the first time the world premiere revealing of the tomb of osiris do y'all remember that no i definitely missed that one <laughs> yeah i remember it and and they um uh was it hawass hawass was there of course and i believe it was geraldo or maury povich i don't know why those two names stick but anyway one of those two and they presented it and it was not the tomb of osiris <laughs> what was it <laughs> nothing i mean um well nobody was in it no body corpse was in it mummy or anything was in it but was it Osiris the dead? Uh, as in that that mistook or what? I'm trying to give him benefit of the doubt. Yeah, I mean, we understand that that the deceased is called Wasir. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but that's in the culture. And so every tomb is a tomb of Osiris. But this particular tomb, they thought it was the tomb of a person named Osiris. I mean, you know, the god Osiris. That wasn't true. So there's a lot. There's yeah, a lot. some of these claims, like uh, that when you hear them, some, some of them are just so ridiculous. Like I, I feel so tired, like sometimes, you know, like, because there are some claims that, that are good, that um, it's so intriguing that it makes you go into this treasure hunt trying to find out stuff. You know, those are like the good stuff. But then the ones that we get to hear a lot, sometimes you just hear them and they just make you so tired because you just be like, you can't like I for me I just can't believe like you know I would think that was some a story that some children made up but then you find that it's like adult adults doing that and then and then you know and and, and you know having this whole big event outside you know based around that particular very childish claim that they come up with like it just it feels like like we are just doomed you know sometimes it may that's why I feel like I lose energy but then once in a while, there are some really good um, things that come about that make, you know, get you on that uh, search and seeking uh, research mode to find, to figure out stuff. But they're very rare. You don't get to hear them nowadays. Yeah. And people have to understand that um, I see Bud John said, have the, have the aliens that the government is about to announce in the coming weeks to peer review. Heard it on the news. Um, you know, I'm telling you the way that science i don't see a lot of people really don't understand science and i know that because of how people describe it and and things and it's almost like a theory you know where people think that a theory is simply a an opinion or a guess and stuff and they don't understand what a theory is but that's how it's used and then it becomes popularly used that way and so science is is the same thing and People have to understand that science is two things at one time. It's, it's a set of tools that we are to use in order to know when we know. And then science is also the outcome of that, 
which is the body of knowledge that is accumulated through using the tools to know when we know. And that's what science is. And so I say that to say that to know something um, like, cause I'm, I'm coming back to the aliens thing. Um, all this time that people talk about aliens, right? You know that, especially today, when, when, aliens, when aliens became popular was in the um, Roswell, you know, Roswell um, issue, dealing with Roswell, Area 51 and Roswell, Roswell and all of that. And, uh, you know, claiming weather balloons and, you know, all that kind of stuff back then. If you go from there up until now, if aliens existed on on the planet, the way that people talk about them and, and all this and that. With with the technology that we have now, with where everybody has a v good quality phone with them at all times called a cell phone and things like that you would think that somebody would have something good like every single time like you you can look at all of the alien documentaries and ancient alien shows and all those paranormal paranormal shows and everything every single person that talks about aliens existing and stuff they can never produce anything definitive ever. It's always an obscure picture of this blur or this, this distant object that could be an animal or something or, or what, whatever, you know, it's always something obscure and everything. And, and back in the 1940s and fifties, okay, that, that, that will win over a lot of people's minds but in 2021 right now that should be the the brunt of jokes at this point you know i like what neil degrasse tyson says about it. he said listen if you he was telling people if you get abducted grab something off of the ship that you get that you take into and bring it back with you <laughs> like say this is from the ship or something, you know, don't come back with just a story. Don't come back with a, um, a out of focus image, or, you know, or, or whatever the case is that's, that's been going on for so long. It's like people, we, we like that. So, you know, and science only deals with things that, that are dem demonstrable that, you know, you could demonstrate. So if aliens do exist, uh, you know, there's no reason for us to accept them until it can be demonstrated. The same way that um, DNA in our body was, um, we gained knowledge of that. You know, for a long time in human history, DNA was not even thought of. DNA not even thought of now we know about dna so look at the gap between us not knowing about it now we know about it so it existed the whole time but we didn't know about it so if aliens exist we don't know about it then let's wait for it to, let's wait for it to cross over into the realm of knowing you know what i'm saying demonstrate that so Hey, I don't know. Heard it on the news. They report said they will present evidence. They have showed a couple of clips on the news. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's great. Yep. Akinyi, do you make a connection with Meru to Luo or is it just a, another foreign thing? The universe is vast and, and the probability is scientific based on math. Well, okay, see, here's the thing about that. The universe is definitely big. The galaxy, the solar system, the galaxy, galaxies, the universe and all that is very, very, very big, very big. And the probability is very, very great 
for life to exist. But our concept of aliens, first of all, why do they have to have, why, why are the aliens that we seem to depict, why do they have the same body plan as human beings? Why, why do they have to have the same body plan? And, and, and all of that good stuff. You know, there's a difference between life existing in various places in the universe versus aliens existing the way that we depict them and stuff. So, you know, we got to get that all clear. You know what I mean? Life existing, you know, it's high, high, high chances that life exists elsewhere. Carbon, carbon based life. You know, because the, the ingredients for life to even sustain, be sustained and everything in its most primitive form that we even know of, there's probabilities of that existing, you know. So. Yeah, considering the age of uh, human life itself and, and, you know, and the age of the planet, people shouldn't always be looking for like uh aliens that you know that resemble humans or kind of have the same things because different you know like just knowing that i mean humans also like a new thing it, it doesn't mean that every planet is the same everything so i don't know why everybody always focus on that like that you know because it could just be plant-based it could be some different forms of life other places but yeah we tend to want to look for um uh, these uh, creatures that might talk or might be telepathic, you know, all this stuff that we might not be able to do, but, you know, <laughs> and then project it into this alien being. Yeah. So. But yeah, to quickly answer, uh, was it the Shabab? I don't know if you pronounced the name correctly. It's asking about making connections between major nature and the Luo. Um, well, I would say that, uh, I mean, certain things do resonate, but I don't even, like, if I'm just going to be very honest, um, I haven't sat down to even try to uh, put comparisons per se um, yet, and I'm not even going to do that <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, you know, my objective is just to kind of get the meta nature to be proficient in the meta nature first. And then um, even though I speak Doluo, uh, I still do want to be as proficient as I can uh, in the language itself, not, about, not being a, a speaker, but just understanding the language and how it works, the grammar, linguistics, everything um, in, in that particular language, uh, Doluo as well, before I even think about um, starting to draw comparisons and, 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 and doing anything that is um, connected between meta nature and the world, you know, I, I'm not even, it's, it's, it's way far ahead for me. So, you know, um, kind of going through the, the curriculum where we have, um, we go through the, we are in the grammar section and then we'll probably go on to linguistics once that is done, uh, we, once we have mastery of that. And then, and that would be for the search meta nature uh, itself. And then, um, and then, um, you know, and, and do, you know, just uh, prop learn my language again properly, <laughs> you know, and not just from a speaker perspective. And then I can do that kind of work. I'm not in any rush like I see most people do. I try not to uh, even try to speak um, so much on it per, per se, because I don't want to be speaking from a point where, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, just for the sake of it or to sound nice or whatever. So just I got to be well informed. So yeah, so I wouldn't even be speaking on that uh, on on that particular uh, yet on similarities or whatever, all that kind of stuff. Not yet. Yeah. All right. Um, Urban Rock Media says uh, alien breaks down as Ali Most High plus N Ruler. Yeah, that's a nice. Um, that's a nice trick that we tend to do with a lot of words, but that's definitely, I mean, you know, I know people do that, but that's definitely not what the word it's a historical uh, trajectory dictates. That's, that's not the etymology of that word alien aliens from Latin basically. And it means something different. I believe it's from um, uh, Ali, Ali 
Enus, alienus, and it means to be different. Not one's own or different, something like that. Because, we, you know, I heard a lot of people say that from back in the day. Alien means Ali, the most high ruler. Like uh, Ali, Allah to Isla. Ali, like Muhammad Ali. Ali, and then N, ruler. The Arabic word Ali and the Sumerian word N or the Akkadian word uh, N for ruler. Like Enki, they, they translate Enki to mean ruler of earth. Ki or Gi is the word for earth, and then N is ruler. So Enki is the ruler of earth. Enlil, Lil is the sky, is N is ruler. Enlil and Enki, ruler of the heavens and the earth. Yes, but that Enki and Enki correlation, man, that, that was a doozy right there. <laughs> yeah that was funny that's funny yeah we have to understand this so anything else in the chat though because it's eleven thirty nine now that's a good presentation um i'm sure so maxims of patahotep very good um very good that should be a must read, recommended read, must read, must have. If you get a translation of it, whatever, read it. Some very good jewels in there, especially about building character, how to treat your your equals, your people you feel that are beneath or above you and stuff like that. Advice from, you know, how to treat your wife, family, fellow brethren, um, employees. All that good stuff is in there. Yep, yes, indeed. We all live and we are aliens to all life in the universe is alien to another life form. I'm not saying that an alien looks like because I don't know is very possible other life alien. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The possibility of life that did not originate from Earth and had its own evolution that yeah those possibilities are there those probabilities are there yeah but when you say alien and aliens exist and and like they're going to announce the presence of aliens people are not thinking about oh there's life somewhere else no they're thinking about what we see in movies Area 51, Roswell, um, Close Encounters of the, of the Third Kind, Fourth Kind, Fifth Kind. You know, ships coming down the size of mountains and cloaking themselves in clouds. I mean, it's, it's, it's so much so that people say that, that spaceships and aliens are in the Bible. Angels are aliens. I mean, if we want to, if, if, I mean, if we want to have that conversation, aliens, I mean, a angels are aliens because angels are not born here, but yet they're from somewhere else and they come to earth and do things. You know, alien, uh, angels are aliens. Jesus was an alien, came from heaven, went back to heaven. Pose will come back on a on a um Crystal City, another ship. Revelations, Book of Revelations talk about this Crystal City coming out of the sky. You know, so um I heard, I heard angels had like some angels had three heads and eight wings. Yep, angels having wings, um, angels being light. All these things kind of correlate to descriptions of, of spaceships and, and alien entities and stuff like that. So, you know, people can go through the Bible and point out the same things. How aliens are always near mountains and how gods, all the gods of different cultures are near mountains, um, near thunder, lightning, clouds. And, and people describe it as distur disturbances in the atmosphere because of the alien technology, um, you know, and all this other kind of things. People talk about that all the time. 
Ezekiel's will um, has been described as being a ship, wheel within a wheel, all of that. So they say the Anunnaki are aliens that came. The whole Zachariah Sitchin uh, series of books. Tiamat, you have uh, Tiamat was named for Earth. You have um, uh, Murdoch or Marduk crashing in or Nibiru uh, crashing into Earth, forming the moon and crashing into it again and and all this and that, forming the um, the inner part of the Earth. And these 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 are ships. These are ancient ships that were that almost like the Death Star in Star Wars and stuff. I mean, come on, can't go that far with those those conversations. Uh, Wajal, do you agree that the Medu Netter itself hasn't been deciphered, but just the acrophonic part? No, I do not agree with that. Uh, Sesh Medu Netra, the writing system has been deciphered. Yeah, I'll put a link uh, on the, uh, for the Sharab, for the book, because some of the things I, uh, uh, he was saying, I think like that, about that and about the writing system, the writing and alphabet, all that um, is, we kind of, you know, explain it very well in the book. So just to understand when you're talking about what is a writing system, what is an alphabet, you know, all that stuff, uh, decipherment, what goes into it, there's nothing like half deciphered, partly deciphered, uh, you know all that stuff, so you, you kind of get to know, you know, how what is what is going on. I think he, you know, that would be a good opportunity to get that book. And um, you know, I mean, it's, it it the book is very thorough. Like you know, I don't know, <laughs> the book is very thorough in explaining all these things that people um kind of like uh mix and cross over and and uh, mix and march when it comes to writing systems. Uh, you know. Um, decipherment translation transliteration all that kind of stuff so you know what it is that is going on so i mean i would definitely recommend that you get the book has the egyptian hier egyptian hieroglyphic writing system been deciphered a rebuttal to w walter williams it's really 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 good like that is like a basic thing that people need to get to you know even before studying the language just to know what because the language is about a writing system so you need to know what a writing system is and what uh, session of nature is and how a writing system works and all that stuff just before you get to know the uh, study of writing system i would definitely recommend the book yep definitely and if you don't have it already shame on you because that book was put out in 2000, I believe, 2018. And, and, you know, it's the book that got everybody shook. That whole, that whole claim about the hieroglyph writing system has not been deciphered. And how can you put a sound to a picture? And all those silly questions, you know. And I'm going to tell you, and I, asked, I said it then, and I've been saying it, and I'll say it right now, that... Um, we really just do not understand the things that we we use every day, you know, and, you know, we addressed all those kind of things, you know, before. But to be more specific about acrophon acrophonic, uh, the acrophonic part, for people who may not under know what that is, um, acrophonic is really the phenomena where um, the object, the first consonant in the naming of the object becomes the sound for the glyph represented uh, represented glyph as a phonograph and so the person is asking um do i agree that metal nature itself hasn't been deciphered but just the acrophonic part and i just disagree because we just know better the acro acrophonic part of the glyphs are the monoliterals themselves where the glyph that represents the single consonantal sounds um the name the name of that object in the culture in a language usually starts with the first sound that became a representative of that sound through the rebus principle all right and that's only a small portion of the language remember monoliterals um by which by the way mean meaning mono meaning one 
and it's one, it represents one consonant, one sound. And that's a very small portion of the writing system. The writing, the, that on, there, there are only um, 24 that are in use. The reed leaf is doubled. So people, some people may, may say 25. And then the water ripple is substituted with the red crown of lower Kemet sometimes. So there's some substitutions some, sometimes, like the double reed leaf is substituted with the slanted strokes. So, but roughly there are 24 in use. But there are over a thousand, like during the old and middle kingdom, there were 750 to a thousand glyphs. And it wasn't until the Ptolemaic era where that increased to 7,000. So when people talk about acrophonic, there are not 7,000 um, things that have, you know, this, this unique uh, phonology in the language that, that just doesn't exist. So the language, the writing system is much more different and complex than that. You have monoliterals, bis, tries, quads, quins, uh, quintiliterals, and the glyphs are are they function differently. They, some function as phonograph, some function as logographs, and some function as um, semantemes or classifiers that we call determinatives. And so, you know, it's it's way more than what people think. And, 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 and it, you know, it's been deciphered. It's just that, yeah, people just don't, people don't understand decipherment either, you know, um, what decipherment is, what does it mean to decipher something, you know? So, um, but the, the, the writing system has been deciphered. No doubt about that. Yeah, plus I see because uh, uh, Deshaar is talking about if you can't look at the glyph and name it walkwise, like um, like looking at each and every glyph, like uh, I mean, the, you have to know what uh, how the glyphs function, <laughs> so you don't a uh, word wise, like um, like what uh, just to kind of get to know what uh what what you're asking the shut up are you trying to figure out what each glyph is like what is like when you see an owl what is the word for an owl when you see chisel what is the word for a chisel like we already know that and you know and because but then after knowing that you also that's separate from how the glyphs are used within the writing system itself so you have to understand what a writing system is and that's what we were trying to get down to hold up pause right there see we um, Dasharab, you know, I can appreciate your um, questions and stuff like that, but you have to understand, not but, um, I would like for you to understand that we've dealt with all of this years ago, and we wrote a book that, that puts people on par with, with, you know, get everybody up to speed, and then we even entertain questions after that and stuff like that. So all these things that you're mentioning, we, we talked about and cover. So for example, you're saying that we have to know the full word. Um, and if we didn't, we didn't fully decipher it. So I tell you what, tell me what word is that? The character I just typed into the chat. Give me that word for that. And we'll just wait. Give us a good one. Oh, Demo said 2016. Wow. I was thinking 2018. Oh, no, no, no. Definitely not 18. What? Was it? Oh, uh, maybe. Hmm. I mean, I know we've been talking about it for a long time. No, oh, no so he's right. It's 2016. Okay, nice. Wow, that's a long time. So that's uh, five years ago. So 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 that's what I, we we've been at this for five years in, in terms that on that specific topic we we've been dealing with that for five years publicly. I mean you know documented. But um I I typed something in the chat. I want you to give me the word for that. Anybody in chat. Give me, give me the word for what I type. Of 
all right, well, I don't want to, you know, waste time. You're not going to be able to give me the word for that. No. Nah. That's a symbol, isn't it? Yeah, it's a character. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I'm saying. See, we don't know how writing systems work. And so we, we have expectations that are not rooted in the realities of how writing systems work. You know, and the letter that I put up there is, is a letter. It's a character in the English alphabet. It's not a word. But we know how it is used, it's utilized. The decipherment is the understanding of how a writing system functions. And so we know how it functions. Like at C can be. A C can be used as an expression in math. It's no, I mean, it's, it's a character in, in the writing system. But listen, we just went through um, Havatic. And even before that, I showed different other scripts that had nothing to do with the pictures that you see on, 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 on the hieroglyph. And this is one of the reasons why we kind of recommend that people understand and get into um, the text properly, because everybody is so... Um, not everybody, like most people are so, um, you know, take so much time looking at the glyphs themselves, like on the form of such meditation that they forget that they're actually looking at a writing system. And is and we see that in the other scripts where, you know, like we showed there were, you, those are abstract symbols. And hopefully, I was hoping that that would, you know, make people understand that you don't just want to look at the script and be like, that's, you know, and, and do your own translations of what you think um, the objects are, because, even within, uh, uh, you know, uh, ancient Egyptian culture, they had, um, you know, a writing system with a script that actually mimics what we have, which is uh, abstract symbols. So at, that, at this point, and that's why we know this is a writing system, you know, so knowing that you don't have, uh, that it, characters or symbols can, very abstract symbols can be used, um, you know, to kind of, to, you know, to, to create a script in a writing system knowing that will make you um, step away from all these other things that, you know, people float around in, like, what does this mean? It hasn't been deciphered and all that kind of stuff. And understand that a writing system is just a writing system. Our Latin script has symbols like what Seba uh, Ujau uh, just showed, the C. What is the C? Uh, it's very abstract. It has nothing to, it, what is it? You, know, you don't know what it is. It's just a character. It's a shape. But within that character, once it gets into a writing system, it represents something and it functions a certain way. And this is what we need to understand and get out of all these other things of trying to look at all these um, objects and, and that we see with the session and, and, and taking it far left where people want to take it. Yeah, uh, brother said, or I'm not sure if it's a sister or brother, but um, C is a Roman modification. You gotta think comedic. Um, no, this is very basic. You gotta think orthography. You gotta think, um, you know, what is orthography, what is a script, the different types of scripts utilized in a writing system and the different kinds of systems there are. And to separate transcription from translations and stuff and know that translations is a semantic endeavor. That's the domain of semantics and trans um, literations and transcriptions is an orthographic endeavor. We have to understand all these things. You have to understand the Rebus principle and how a character or whatever the word is may have nothing to do with how it's functioning to produce um, the visualization of that which is spoken. That's what writing systems do. We have to understand all of those things. That's why you, know, you can't tell me what the word for that character is. You know that in the English language, it represents a sound. So let's try this one. Um, uh, so no, I'm not going to ask what a glyph means because my point is to show you that even if you know what a glyph represents as a word or what it was called, what the object was called, for example, the owl glyph, the, the, the picture of an owl. The, that bird in the language was called mulaj. 
And that's what it was called. But through the Rebus principle, the mm, that 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 um, M sound, initial sound, acrophonically became the phonographic representation of it. So the owl represents the M. But the owl itself is called mulaj or mulej. That's what an owl is called. Just that simple. Mulej has nothing to do with um, the word mer. If I use an owl to spell the word mer, which means to wish, to desire, to love, that owl and what it's called has nothing whatsoever to do with the word mer. Mer, which is a hole to farm or to till the ground. An owl and a garden hole have nothing to do with each other. Nothing whatsoever to do with each other. So again, we have to understand how writing systems work. And to and, and once you do, then you know it'll kind of be sh sh more straightforward. Yeah, plus um even even just an example with the owl where we had um the word emira, we just have the owl and 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 all of that and 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 then the map. I mean, just with the owl for emi, you can see that you're not really trying to it's not the word owl itself, but it's the owl uh, uh, glyph that is being used for something completely different. And even in that in that sense, doesn't even have the aquaphonics uh, principle working on that. So these are things that I just recommend. Just if you get that book, <laughs> just get that book, and then it's actually a short read, and it's a small book you can fit in a in a pocket. You know, just get to know what a writing system is, because really most of that part, that confusion part, is always just there because of people not understanding what a writing system is. That's where the problem goes. But once once you fully, fully understand what a writing system is, what scripts are, like Sebauja was saying, what um, orthography is uh, and all that stuff, everything falls into place. Like then it's easier to even, you know, you, you're not, you understand all the different writing systems, even our own writing system and how it works. So, you know, but yeah, just get the book, you know, because <laughs> yeah, it's a good read, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, salute champ, that is correct. Um, a cut is not a cut. Uh, the word cut is description of a thing, but what the actual thing is. Yeah, yeah, so the word we're using is uh, is representation. And you've seen like Seba Ujau usually uses what we call that uh, holy trinity uh, figure symbol where you have, um, you know, you have what is a, you know, what there's a, a, a word is actually like a placeholder for a, uh, uh, you know, a concept of something. So when you say the word cut, you, the, when you when you say it or when you write it, it that is not the cut, but it's a representation of um, what the cut is. So it's a placeholder for that particular concept. So when you write it or when you say it, then somebody understands in their head, then they picture um, something else. It's not that. So yeah, that is correct. So jump. Uh, urban rock media kind of on the fence because there are meanings names associated with the doom club both symbolically and as witnesses them and it was derived from middle nature um yeah i don't know about that um you know you might know better i haven't studied that particular writing system yeah yeah i mean we you know 2016 <laughs> five years <laughs> um that nobody like like you can't have you know like you say it's fully deciphered you can't have partially or decipher something halfway it's either deciphered or it's not deciphered you know but yeah then you know such matter nature has been deciphered you know what we are what some people might actually have uh might mean when they say something like this is about the translations uh, itself, not the decipherment, but the translation is like, are uh, these translations um, fully correct? And this is where, um, you know, there is refinement and 
um, and people, um, especially from the African School of Egyptology, coming in and um, you know refining the translations, getting more meanings by doing um, comparative uh, linguistics with um, with other African languages, and then getting proper um, you know translations that you know that mean better. So on that part, I do understand, and I think that's what some people. Or might be trying to say when they talk about decipherment, but it's not decipherment, it's the translation bit that um, uh, is still in the works. Or, you know, we have a lot of translations that make sense. Yeah, it's just a few things here and there that you come across, you know, the more we learn, we could get, you know, better translations of it from what I've seen. So maybe that. So maybe that's what uh, Dashara, maybe that's what you meant. Uh, translation, not decipherment. Let me know I'm in the chat. <laughs> oh, Emerald tablets. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, but yeah, since, um, it, you know, we talked about since we kind of uh, got into other topics, especially the writing system uh, and the script, just to kind of, uh, um, you know, give some extra cl clarification on what the difference between a writing system and a script. So a writing system is kind of like when you have, um, you know, it's, it's a system. And usually um, some people use writing system and scripts interchangeably, but um, what you want to know is that um, uh, you know a writing system you know, is a method or a system, and that's why it's called you know writing system. And within it, there are two things that always go hand in hand, and that is um, the script and the orthography. And then um, what the script is is what you see the signs that you have, like in the alphabet. Uh, you know, alphabet we have like the A, B, C, D, whatever the you know those letters and those those signs. And then in such Middle Nature, you have all those different glyphs thousand different glyphs so that's your script and those are the signs that um the set of signs that make up um, that particular script then you have um your orthography and orthography is um that takes that the, that works that is the rules like what are the rules uh, for this particular writing system so like in latin in the latin script uh, orthography you might find things like um um like uh period or, or full stop that will let you know you're at the end of a sentence. You have um, uppercase, lowercase for like um, proper nouns, and uh, and 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 things of that nature. So those are the rules, and th and those particular rules. That's what is known as the orthography. So when you put the orthography and the script, as in the rules, and then the signs or the set of signs together, and that's when you get a writing system. So, and then you find that within a writing system, then you can find different scripts. Like we saw with the Sesh Nature, where you have um, the formal uh, Sesh Nature, then you had the, the, um, the simplified ones, like the, um, you know, the ones we see on the, on the, on the uh, Book of the Dead. And then you see the ones in the, you know, Havaric, um, and then, um, and then you have like uh, Demotic and all that stuff. Those are the different scripts within that particular writing system. So hopefully that kind of clarifies um, things as well. And you can see that um, not, all, not the other script we work with today had nothing to do with the objects themselves. So we can't be talking too much about, you know, what they look like and what they represent is how do they function in that particular writing system. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's what I said. Only the aquaphonic part. Uh, no, not only the aquaphonic part was solved. Um, 
nah so yeah just get the book because because uh, <laughs> you're going to mix up a lot of things uh, just get the book so you understand what is uh, decipherment and what 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 is the task of um, people who decipher what are they looking for and all that stuff and you know then you'll understand why you can't be putting those two together like the aquaphonic part being solved you know and then just the decipherment not being solved because that that's not how it works yeah the mono the mono literals are um you know are based off of like the aquaphonic um principle clearly um but and you know so and that's why the most of the part and, and the we, we do kind of refer to them as the um as the quote-unquote alphabet i mean they're not an alphabet but that's how they kind of uh, function like like the alphabet but that being part of, uh, of of the alphabet has nothing to do with the decipherment process so you just have to separate those two when discussing the um, decipherment so you don't mix them up all right apologize i'm i'm back um I don't know where we left off. People were talking about the language. Salute Champ says a cat is not a cat. The word cat is a description of a thing, but not what the actual thing is. Correct. Uh, you addressed that already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he was talking about what, you know, you do explain with the word and, you know, what is a word. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that was that was a good example from him. <laughs> I think. Well, no. Well, okay. But here's how you have to word that, though. Um, the word cat is not the entity of the cat. They're not the same. Like the word elephant, and I always use elephant, not cat. Yeah. The word elephant is not the elephant itself. It is a, um, a word that we refer to as a substantive because it refers to an entity. So we have to use the word referent. The referent of the word is the entity itself, but the word is um, the refer, you know, refers to it. So yeah, the elephant is not the elephant itself. A cat, the word cat is not the cat itself. All right, but that's, but that's yes. different than what the conversation was about in terms of decipherment. The um, writing system has been deciphered. I can tell you everything about the writing system. So anybody who thinks that the writing system has not been deciphered, click the link and come in here and, um, and let's have a discussion about that. And I guarantee you that I can tell you everything that you could think of to ask me about the writing system. Um, I'll straighten you out. So I don't know if the link is still posted. But the writing system has been deciphered. It's the problem is that people may not be familiar with what is the, what does it mean to be deciphered? Because mm -hmm. I'm looking at the questions in the conversation now. Acrophony is different than decipherment. The meaning is different than decipherment. Semantic, the translation is a, is a semantic endeavor. Endeavor, decipherment is a, is is to understand the system of how the writing system represents the um what is spoken all right i mean i mean you know people got you know we have a book for it so it's, there's no need for us to rehash the book people should get the book and read then come and ask some questions about that but um to kind of home in on some of the things of uh, he said the acrophonic part was solved no Listen, every language has a phonological inventory. And so um, here's a question. What is, um, we well, have to understand phonology, but, but here's my question though. Um, all right, this is a question and I'm not trying to, you know, um, um, be, you know, with no other gender, whatever, or whatever the case is, but in the, in the chat, somebody in chat, tell me what a phoneme is.
Anybody in the chat? What is a phony? And I'm, you know, I'm not going to wait. I know, I know there's a delay. All right, but so I'm gonna put that out there. What is a phony? Because these these little, these basic principles need to be understood, you know, in in a conversation like this, and we have to understand um, these in order to, you know, understand, you know, these answers and things. All right, not phonology, not the study of of phones and things like that, but um, a phony. What is a phony? Yeah, what is a phony? Okay, so here's the thing. So Deshrab, I can tell by his comment that that yeah, he doesn't know he or she doesn't know, um, a, uh, you know, the things that we're encouraging the person need to know in order to understand. Understand uh, is so. Because he says, uh, see, in Hebrew, Aleph is A, B is Bet, but he meant the other way around. A is Aleph, B is Bet, and so on, or whatever the case is. Um, and if we could do that with, with uh, Deshara, I mean, with um, Seshmet or Netcher, then he'll believe that it's been deciphered. And see, that's very, very shallow, because I just now said about 20 minutes ago that the language is above and beyond um, an alphabet monoliterals the monoliterals of sesh metal nature can be likened unto an alphabet but it itself is not an alphabet it doesn't act as an alphabet but that's the closest thing to an alphabet the language has biliterals a biliteral means that it's a single picture of something single glyph but it represents two consonants okay so that throws that out the water all right and i'm not talking about two transliterated characters like for example the sh sound in English that we spell out with two characters, S and an H, is actually a single sound. Okay, so I'm not talking about those or anything. Like the, uh, um, in Hebrew or Arabic or the Semitic languages, you have those um, sounds that we would write down with two characters, like the K and the H, the kh sound, or the ghe sound, like the word chalaka. Chalaka, that KH is actually a single sound. And so in order to have this, con this conversation, um, we would have to understand um, the proper name of sounds and how they're represented in the various different writing systems. And as Dr. Rab said, Wajal, well, you need to stop learning from white people. Look, that, that's your uh, the, no, next, that's <laughs> the next time you 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 come on the channel, just click the link. So and I'll show you just how much I learned from white people. I, I'll show how, how, how much you could be right or wrong about me learning from white people. Yeah, see, now that 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 can give a problem because um, because trust me, I see a lot from uh, black people. And then when I talk about black people everywhere, even especially on the continent, trying to teach medical nature and just doing all kinds of wrong um, comparative linguistics and, and, you know, from the continent. Yeah. And, and I've seen even people use even things in, in, in my language that is just false you know, and, and people would do it just for the sake of, you know, doing it, you know, so imagine somebody trying to learn from that person because they are not white, they're black. Like, see, maybe that's why the shadow you're getting all the wrong things because you're trying to learn from people based on skin color as opposed to learning from people based on something that is correct or false. You don't want to do that because, nah, see, that's a problem. Well, I mean, but see, I'm, I'm going to keep it simple. I, I can use that and make an example out of, out of that or teaching moment. But here's what everybody else needs to understand, because I, I doubt that that is going to uh, grasp this with his comments, his or her comments. Um, Seshmedu Netcher writing system consists of pictographs. OK, all of the glyphs are pictographs. That's what they are. And that simply means that the glyphs themselves 
are pictures of things that are in or were in the environment of the people, whether it's the flora, fauna, or man-made objects. They're all pictures of different items. Okay, that's what they are. Now, that's completely different from how they were utilized in the writing system. And so how they function in the writing system is one of three different ways within any given word. One is as a phonograph, which simply means that it represents a phone, a sound. Okay. And it could be a single sound, which we refer to as a mono literal. It could be two, which is a bi literal, three tri literal, four quadriliteral, and so on. Okay. But all of those fall under phonographs, function wise. Remember, they're all pictographs, is what they are, but how they function is different. So those are phonographs. Two, they can function as logographs, meaning that these glyphs can represent entire words. So, for example, the word ib or the glyph for ib is the glyph of a heart. So it's a single glyph. It's a picture of a heart, but it represents the word ib. OK, and it happens to be a bilateral as well. OK, so that represents the whole word. Then three, there are glyphs that are mute and we don't transliterate them and mute, meaning they're not pronounced, but they're there to aid the reader. And it's a semantine, which means that it represents or functions uh, related to meaning. It gives the meaning of the word. It aids in identifying the meaning of the word that it belongs to. Okay, and we refer to those as determinatives. So it helps determine, so people nickname them determinatives. But in actuality, they're semantines, and some people refer to them as classifiers because it helps classify at least the, the substantives in the language. Most people know them as nouns. So the nouns have different classes and um, categories that they fall in. That's what these determinatives help do. All right. So we have to understand all of that to understand, you know, some of the things that are being said. So when someone asked about the acrophonic um, value of glyphs, now we're getting into the phonological inventory of the language. Every language has a fixed um, phonological inventory, fixed phonology. Like English only has but so many sounds in it. Arabic only has but so many sounds in it, unique sounds. And that's what I said about a phoneme. Um, a phoneme, me asking about a phoneme is not a deflection or a detraction from anything. It is part of the lesson because you have to know what a phoneme is in the language, which represents a, a um, unique sound that if changed or swapped for another one would change the meaning of whatever word that that phoneme is a part of. And so all languages have a fixed number of those. Okay, regardless of what the phone is, the phoneme is what makes the difference. And so we have to understand that as well. And then you have the grapheme that is the visual representation of these phones or phonemes. And then you have the graphs. All right, and so the characters, we call them graphs. So that's why you say um, the glyph or character, these are graphs. So we say phonograph, logo graph, ideograph for, idea, it, for ideas. So we have all of, all of that um, at play. And all of that is known and knowable because the writing system has been deciphered. That's it. So is there anything that I missed? Uh, yeah, Darius says, um, if I wanted to understand how to write 
complex syntax in Medu, which one of your books would you recommend? Um, Darius is asking that. Uh, complex sy syntax, you have to, you have to um, learn the grammar, you know, because remember, syntax is one half of grammar. Grammar consists of morphology and syntax. And some people refer to grammar as morpho syntax, but grammar is both. Syntax is the external inventory of words and the relationships of these words with each other and so on and so forth. And morphology is the internal inventory of words, meaning you know the, the elements of words and how words are built up and so on and so forth, the forms and shape. Morph means form. So morphology of, uh, and syntax. So when you're asking, you know, as far as a book, you're, you, you know, you're asking about grammar. And so me, one of our books, I haven't published a grammar book as of yet. So when I, when I do publish it, then I'll be able to recommend, you know, suggest um, that book. But for now, you know, you could pick up a grammar book, uh, Egyptian grammar book, and dig in. All right. I just want you to understand that you're asking about the grammar. Um, let's see any, okay, that's right. White people themselves will tell you don't run with our interpretations. Okay. So let me address that again, as suspected and as predictable or predicted or easily predictable, um, that's right. is confusing interpretation from decipherment. And this is the problem that we had five years ago with people who were making those claims back then. They don't know how to di differentiate between interpretation and translation from decipherment. And so, so what if they say don't go with um, our interpretations? All right. So, I mean, that, that's like irrelevant to decipherment. Um, i make sure I'm not missing anything. I doubt a far person would mislead you on metal nature. They point tights. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. See, the thing is, once you learn, um, and this, and this, what I was saying um, about um, also African scholars um, or some people on the continent also, um, you know, taking people for a ride, that doesn't mean everybody, or, and that does not even mean that some people are doing it purposefully. It's just that, um, it's this environment that you see here. It's an, it's an, it, that that also happens everywhere else, where people just don't understand, um, you know, the correct me method of doing things, and and um, you know, so so you will see some people who will just think that actually the the way to compare things, like especially metal nature with other languages, whether it be like Hebrew language or whatever, or it could be like another African language, is just to look at words that sound alike, like, oh, this word look like this other word in, in, in my mother tongue, so this is what it means. And then once, you, once you're fixated with that, it's so easy to, to, to find things that you can grab on to kind of like support your claim, then those things are not um, academic or, or scholarly at all. You know, so, but the thing is, what for why we're trying to say that, you know, get the book and, and then, you know, learn and understand how writing system works is because once you understand how things work, then um, when you listen to people or, you know, whether they are from the continent or whether they are, they are white people, they're black people, it doesn't matter. Then you can, you yourself, you have the, the correct tools to discern and know what is, what, what is correct uh, information who has done the correct work and came up with, um, a, you know, a proper conclusion of things in that sense. So you are in control of, you know, the, uh, what information that, you know, that you are intaking, what is correct, as opposed to just saying that I'm going to take this because it's from a black person and I'm going to push this away because it's from a white, a white person. That's, that's not scholarship. I mean, you could do that outside of scholarship and just have fun out there, but don't, don't come and discuss it on a scholar, on a scholarship discussion and say, this is what I do, or this is how I found, uh, this is how I came to this conclusion. It's not gonna work in here because you have to understand what is going on in the subject that you are discussing before. Even when you're asking questions, you gotta ask a question from an informed um, perspective as well. So that's all I was saying about that. All right, so um, anybody else have any questions in the chat? And uh, did anybody post a link? Can someone post a link up? Got a, got a few. Um... Got some time to um, 
to use up. Can somebody post a link? I mean, you know, the thing is, is that, uh, see, you know, I, I listen, I, I've been doing this for a while and people still say Metu Netcher and not even know that the language is called Rodney Kimmett and the writing system, Sesh Metu Netcher, you know, that speaks something. And then the fact that um, people are still talking about decipherment, look, that ship has sailed a long time ago. The, the writing system has been deciphered. And so the, the rubber hits the road when people can click that link. And I will put up some um, an inscription, and then I want you to read it right here, right now. All right, period. Because that pretty much always ends the discussions. Even if people speak um, eight different African languages, people attempt to try to translate uh, or transcribe um, Seshmet or Netra into their language and stuff like that. They do it by dictionaries. People live in those dictionaries and do it like for one word, but they don't do full passages and i've seen people make that attempt i've seen people try to do it with um tegrina or um uh, what's the other language in somali somalia and um ethiopia um there's two languages there forget um but there's somebody that published a book that that made those attempts to do that and you know is that guy, like the Amharic in Ethiopia or what? No, not Amharic. No. Um, there's two languages. Whatever those languages are, I'm saying people made it, the attempt. And then you have people, like I know on Facebook, there's a person who um, tries to, uh, there's a person who tries to, yeah. Um, do the same thing with with their own um, South African Bantu language, and they miss the mark a lot. Yeah, people make up stuff. Um, yeah, so while we waiting, uh, <laughs> speaking of people making up stuff, um, I remember, hold on one second. Yeah, actually, I remember, um, I think it was like years back uh, when I actually just, just, just started reading um, Sesh for the Nature and I came across uh, <laughs> one person. Uh, I think the name was, um, there are two black lotuses out here, but one of them is legit. The other one was just pseudo as hell. And uh, he had this, um, you know, how... And he was writing this um, this thing for a long time. I just wasn't aware of, of it. But he had contacted some um, Lua people somewhere in, in 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 Kenya, I guess. And and he was doing some scholarship with them that he was using to you know to forward his stuff. So and he was talking about the Lua people actually, um, you know that the Lua people don't even need to to re to study such nature that they just look at the at these glyphs and and you know and um and then they can you know for me they they can they know what the glyphs are, you know the hieroglyphs mean and I'm like man like I mean <laughs> did I miss where did I miss that gene somewhere because I'm Lua and I'm I'm out here trying to learn this uh <laughs> such better nature I don't have those special powers that this uh that my people have like this guy is claiming and people buy that stuff because a lot of because he had uh videos just talking about all this kind of stuff and he was he was doing some um 
some Lua translations and things like this and all. And I'm like, man, this is how people get, uh, you know, bamboozled out here because, and I don't blame, you know, I don't blame and whoever was from the continent that was feeding him all that kind of stuff. I don't blame them because he probably paid for it. And if you pay, you know, and you need a story, somebody will give you that story, you know, so that's what he got. So, and this is one of the things that I learned very early on that you can't, um, especially on, on the diaspora, people will just say that because people are, people are from their continent. So when you know somebody from their continent says something, then that's legit, you know, and it's true. But it's not, and then you don't even you know have ways of verifying all these wild uh, things that people are talking about. So that's the thing; it's got nothing to do with um, you know with skin color when it comes to scholarship, because you will get bamboozled by anybody out here, you know, if that's how you you know you value that particular scholarship. So I just wanted to share that because that was the first time I found out that my people actually read such Meta Nature just by looking at it and the information just comes through, you know, our, our head. <laughs> but nah, that is not true. But some people out here actually believed that, you know, but yeah. So you still gotta, a writing system is a writing system. You gotta learn it. You know, there are no shortcuts like, um, if you don't, if you want to learn Arabic and you want to learn the script, you've got to learn the script. Somebody who has never learned the Latin script and wants to read letters and stuff, everybody has to go to school and learn the, that particular uh, script so that you can actually read newspapers. You can read, and you know, you can use Facebook. So it, it's the same for um, for for Sesh Nature. There are no shortcuts. Nobody's gonna tell you that this is my mother tongue. I speak a hundred um, African languages, so I know Sesh Nature. It doesn't work that way. You know, so yeah, a writing system is a writing system. You gotta learn it. There's a process, you know. Okay, so um, I guess nobody has anything else to say. We might actually have to soon, unless there was, let me look at the chat because <laughs> I wasn't looking at the chat. Uh, I think all rules are the same yet over time pronunciation and meaning change with the occurrence. Uh, probably yes. I don't know what we were speaking on in particular. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, Hotep's uh, Sen Ong coming all the way from South Hello. Africa. So um, let's see. So um, I studied in China. They would often ask for the script when they don't understand your pronunciation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. See that, that, yeah. Yeah, when you don't understand something because people have different pronunciations, but when you read it, it's much more clear. We we'll probably need to get the shower up here next time. <laughs> but make sure you get the book after after the show. <laughs> you know, I think you will like it. Okay, so um, anything else before we end? I think it will be a good time to kind of end. Um, anybody on the panel, if you have uh, any? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Uh, anybody else on the panel? Uh, Tamika, Chris, Zen, if you have some last words. 
before we end? Oh yeah, dua sen um sen doni uh, doni yeah, <laughs> dua. What's my focus of studies? Uh, I'll just finish that and then I'll let uh, Mika go ahead. So yeah, it's just search meta nature at this point. Uh, you know, trying to get the grammar down and then we we'll move over to linguistics and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that. But yeah, so what do you have to say, hey, Mika? <laughs> Mika. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say you did a great job, and no, I don't have too much to say now. Okay, so uh, you don't have any words for the sharab <laughs> with this decipherment? No. Do you think? Yeah. Uh, do would you would you think? You know, has the sesh sesh nature has it been deciphered? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I mean, shoot. <laughs> I mean, you're reading the session, it's not, okay, yeah. But yeah, no, it has been deciphered. Okay, so he agrees that it's been deciphered. Now, I think, like I said, get the book so you'll understand what it is you're trying to say. And I know it's not decipherment. So I'm leaning more towards you're trying to, you're trying to talk about the translation and not decipherment. But yeah, get the book. I think it will help you understand uh, the gray area or the question that you might want to ask a little bit better. All right. So I'm um, back, but I think that I pretty much was addressing those things that were saying in, in the chat. Yeah. Right, so. I got it, Mark. Um, I just say, should I not that? I see off at it. Hmm? That again? Uh, uh, okay all right okay. Uh, i just want to say something though um that hopefully people who watch this video and read the chat just understand that um we have a book if you're interested in in the decipherment process and the things that we were talking about uh the book is actually in the link in the description of pretty much all of our videos um now and in including this one um it's available on amazon I would suggest that you get it, read through it, and anything that you need clarification on, you know, you come and you can ask um, questions, you know, ask, you know, feel free to ask us questions for clarification or, or whatever the case is. Um, but to understand decipherment, this is why we wrote a book. This is not something that we're going to sit and um, have a 15 minute um, conversation about to show decipherment. And so this is why we chose to write a book and we did it the way we did it to address the claims. We went through every, each and every one of Walter Williams' claims about the decipherment. He claimed that it wasn't, and we showed and demonstrated that it was. And a lot of these questions that come up today in the chat are related to all of those, that same sentiment. And so this is why we say, just get the book and then ask questions because it's too much to explain. You know, people are, are using terms and asking questions not from a place of, of knowing, but more so a place of not knowing, and which is fine, but then it, make, it forces us to, to really unpack it when we wrote the book to do that. So it's kind of unfair. And so what I've been doing is in a very, very short, condensed way is just to mention things so that people can go and check out. So I was talking about the glyphs, um, what they are. All of the glyphs are pictographs. They are pictures of things but they function in the ways that I already described. That's how they function in any given word. Some glyphs can function in all three of those ways while others can't, cannot. Also make sure you study the Rebus principle and what it is and how it's related, how important it is to writing itself, to what, what's, what's being called writing itself. You have, people have to understand that. And then people have to understand, once you understand how the writing system works, which is, the bulk of a beginner's level of study for this. Now, I've been teaching for 10 years and, 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 you know, I drive these points home every single time about the writing system because you have to learn the writing system before you get into the, the um, more complex gr grammatical features and things of the language. You have to know how the writing system represents the language and the language Rodney Kimmett is represented visually as such metal nature. Um, and that's just the way it is. And so we have to study it and approach it that way. 
So um, just keep all that good stuff in mind when it comes to um, the question or the issue about decipherment. All right. It's not about um, translations or things like that. The meaning, because when you get into meaning, that's the that's the whole semantic umbrella, pragmatics and semantics. You're getting into that, those two areas. And under that, you have literal, figurative, and then the host of figurative expressions. You got tropes, similes, hyperboles, analogies, um, metaphors, all these other kind of things. You get into a whole different conversation when you talk about that. It's not what decipherment is. All right. So people got to make those distinctions um, and all of those good things. All right. So no matter how afar you are and how afar you were, are, or were, and at one point um, writing the, the tales of um, the Beja people and Luo people, and now writing the tales of afar people, is not going to change the fact that after all these years, people who come on and talk the same stuff, they still don't know what they're talking about. All right. Uh, Desherab, I'm speaking to you. So next time that you are free and we're live, you will come on a link and everything. We can have a discussion, but we'll have an inscription up and we can go through the inscription itself. And then, you know, you can um, show us and point out what you're talking about. All right, within the description. So I want you to demonstrate and display your skills and um, you, you know, do what you're talking about um, and make your points. All right. So hopefully we could do that. All right. So hopefully people understand uh, that. And uh, the brother says, or sister says that um, decipherment means know the full word, not just the initial. And nobody's talking about the initial except Dasharab. He's the one that brought up, or she's the one that brought up, acrophonic. And everyone should understand what acrophony is. No one brought up that except for, for this person. <laughs> and now this person say it means the full and not just the initial. So, uh, you know, this is uh, borderline dipping into the pseudo. Or people use words they don't understand. All right, so uh, that's it. But but that's a very good uh, presentation, um, Emiket, and emphasis on hieratic. And I know that that is definitely your forte. Um, the book that's on the screen, um, Simplify Seshmeto Nature Penmanship, A Lesson in Egyptian Hieroglyphic Writing, Book One, Monoliterals. All right, so this is an excellent book. Everybody in the chat, you, if you don't have it, shame on you, um, but, but um, support and get the book and you will thank me later, all right, because it explains um, everything that Amy Kett was saying earlier and also some of the things we were saying now, all right, um, but overall, it actually teaches you how to actually write or aka draw the um, monoliterals in the different strokes, um, which stroke comes first, which stroke comes second, third, and all those good things, all right? So, but I'm waiting for book two. What's up, uh, Amy Cat? Where, where, where's book two at? Where's, what happened? What happened to book two? Uh, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming by a boat. <laughs> nah, but it, it's coming. It'll be worth the wait, I think. Yeah, I mean, all right. So, looking out for book two. Uh, so Chris, Mika, I know it's late. Y'all probably fell asleep. Well, I know Mika didn't fall asleep. Mika's probably, Mika probably did great. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm chilling. Listen. Okay, okay. So Mika, um, what, what do you think about uh, um, the word Anki, uh, Osir being Anki and related to Inki? What, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, pseudo. You said a pseudo? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just just checking. All right. Just just checking. So yeah. All right. There you have it. Mika spoke. So that's what it is. Yep. <laughs> All right. 
she's so saying like she has no time for it. Like that's too dope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. somebody brought that to my attention. And I, I thought they were joking at first until um they posted a clip of video of uh the claim being made and stuff like that. I said, wow, okay. Like, wow. Namir being Nimrod is another one. I man, I tell you, man, it's, 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 uh, it's like the Wild Wild West on the YouTube streets. You know? People think they know something when they, man, oh, I don't understand how people do that. All right. Anything else? Because I'm, I'm, I'm prolonging this. Y'all could tell like, I came in late. I, I didn't get a chance to to be MC Iron Lung tonight, so I'm trying to prolong it. You know? Okay, uh, let's see what Sin uh, Unk is talking about. Amy, it drop, please drop me a quote for 20 of your book. Oh. Okay, okay, that's good. Yeah, but let me just, um, you know, not to, you know, toot my own horn or whatever, but it, literally, like, the whole reason why I came up with the book was because when he come when he comes to drawing or anything like I'm I wouldn't say I would I'm a, an artistic person so but the thing is I was like in the point where I really wanted to like I, I, I sat and I'm like if I'm going to be a scribe there's no scribe that can't write right you're not a scribe until you can write right because that's the whole point of being a scribe you scribe but then the challenge is always like seeing how people draw and I'm like that's not you know like when you're drawing all these glyphs and it takes time and then they all end up looking messy so my thing was you know how would I just go about being able to write because if you think about it those people back then you know um you know that was writing so you couldn't say that I can't write if you have to write you write you know so the whole point was to figure out how you know you can actually write without being artistically inclined you know like being like somebody who's like artistic you know but be able to write things that are neat and um you know so you know I sat down and I, you know and then when I went once I got a system of how you know writing it and I was writing it and I know um then Sabuja was like well you know if you're writing this this well then you have to you know be able to explain that to other people you know and that wasn't easy for me so even going through that book there was, um, I had um, different, I had to go through different processes of trying to figure out a way to explain it where anybody could, could write. And it took also a while because I like to experiment and put my book through the test, you know, like if that system works. So um, at the end, you know, and I was using my mom, you know, and she can't, <laughs> she can't write, she can't, I mean, she can't draw or anything. So, so in the beginning, she was drawing all kinds of funny stuff. Then I had to figure out a way where somebody like her, who is not even interested in the sesh, but can actually take all the, the, the glyphs that I present and actually um, write them correctly. And once I got a better, a good way of explaining um, the whole process of, of writing shapes, then I put the book together. I, that was the final uh, method that I used because I went through different methods. So that, you know, it, it really works like when you go through it and you follow it um you know step by step it will get you to to be able to write things that look presentable as opposed to you know feeling like well then I have to draw this glyphs and I'm, I'm not good at drawing trust me even I'm not good at drawing but I can write those glyphs I can scribe you know so and it's a simple method of you know there's a way you have to uh, approach writing or drawing uh to you know in a, in in a simplified form where it becomes easier and you just write them and you know it, it works so yeah just get the book and it's really focused on the technical bits <clears throat> but it'll be worth it because it works <laughs> i mean i can write and i can draw <laughs> but i can write fish all right i guess lastly i'm, I'm just going to share the table of contents to the book so that people who don't have the book you'll see the things that are being discussed in the book and this book, by the way, is um, the rebuttal to Walter Williams. Uh, has the Egyptian hieroglyphic writing system been deciphered? A rebuttal to Walter Williams. That's the title of the book. And so I'm just going to um, scroll through. And hopefully people can see that online. Um, it must be a delay. All right, there we go. So I'm just going to scroll through. So, oh, let me get my cursor over here. Okay, so it, the book is broken up into two parts. Part one is 
what you need to know, and this is and this is what I was mentioned earlier. In order in order to uh, successfully rebut the claims to the reader from the reader's perspective, you have to lay out some fu fundamentals. And so we we put this in two parts. One part one is what you need to know, and you have to know these things in order to, for us to even get into the rebuttal. So part one is what you need to know. And if you look at it, part two is the actual rebuttal. All right, so there's a little over 50 pages of just what you need to know. Okay, so we had to describe things in 50 pages. So what we touch on is what is decipherment? What is language? What is a writing system? The types of writing systems? What are hieroglyphs? Uh, we talk about pictograms or pictographs, ideogram, ideographs. Logogram, logographs, phonogram, phonographs, the Rebus principle we explain. We explain the um, absence of vowels in, in the writing system, what determinatives are, um, the fact that there's no punctuation. We describe what is transliteration and what is translation, and then the pronunciation, okay, the fun, the, 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 phones how the language sounds and things like that we talk about that then we summarize then from there we get into the rebuttal so we um lay out the claims as they are verbatim and then we re rebuttal them all right so we go claim for claim point for point and rebut and then we uh give a conclusion and so on and so forth all right so i just want to and that's pretty much um the book then we have appendices of uh, glyph list and things like that. All right. So that's pretty much how the book is laid out. And again, if you get it, you have to know all about all of these things to really understand um, about decipherment and whether, you know, there's a valid claim being made. And you'll come to a conclusion that no, it's not. So all of the claims, I'm going to give you an example of one of the claims. So I'm going to Go on down. Let me just go quick down to one of the claims. So, for example, um, let's get a good one here. Um, point six. What's the that's a rebuttal? Six point six. Um, I'm trying to show a good one that I could just show real quick. Uh, let's go. I don't know. I mean, all, all of these are good. All right, let's just do this one. Uh, what was that one? Okay, so he, here's one of the points that Walter Williams were, uh, made. He basically was saying that the Canopus Stone doesn't exist. You know, he made it, you know, claim, and I'm paraphrasing. Um, He, he actually asked the question, who discovered the Canopus stone? And he talked about it. I, you know, we, we go over here. So let me go up. Let me go up to the claim. Uh, where is the original, where is the original uh, stone of Canopus? He asked that question. But, he's at, but he asked in his book, he asked it as if it doesn't exist. Like, where is it? You know, because it don't exist, nobody can show you. Blah, blah, blah. You know, so he kind of goes into it in that way. So we just answer the question where it is and we give where it is. The original stone, we we give the um the catalog number and and then we even show it. We show it in black and white, which is the original, and it got cracked, and then a a um remake of it from a from a um plastered mold. Okay, so we showed. I know you y'all can only see um part of it. All right. So anyway, um so so this. This is, you know, what we do. And um, like, let's go up to. All right. here. So this is part of his five questions. So so after he lays out some claims, he had five questions. And so we addressed his five questions. Question number one, he said, after 44 years of widespread disagreement among European scholars, how how did the discovery of the stone of Canopus in 1866 confirm Champollion's theories and reading of the glyphs? And then we answer it. All right, so he asked some questions that he must have felt that were unanswerable, and we answered them. All right, but that was after we went through all of his claims. So anyway, but get the book. All right.
and then come if you have any questions for us then by all means you can ask us uh the questions all right so hopefully uh y'all can do that uh let's see would y'all why would you belittle the beja um that should have nobody belittled the beja at all so um you really really have to pay attention and then he goes on why do you think red sea have no idea what they're talking about you sound white people that say egyptians are aliens nothing that you just type there um is relevant to what i said at all at no point in time have i belittled beja to be specific there are people who um deal with beja and promote the beja and um you know that group of people as the egyptians and say that the egyptian language is their language and so on and so forth that's how i was referring to not belittling uh the beja or anybody i don't belittle any 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 group of people all right so you gotta listen up all right so hopefully next time instead of all the chatting that we can get Deshrab in here to share um the opinions that he's he or she is typing out all right so and i hope we don't get dr seuss and stuff like that and start talking about cat in the hat uh you know green eggs and ham and you know a is for apple b is for bat a is for I live. B is for bed. I live. Bet. Lamb. Dal. Ein. Gein. Ich mich sang schnees. <laughs> we're going to stop me. What we going? We're going to start. Uh, uh, you know, we're going to do that. I mean, we could do that. We got, we got fun. No problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh my number one tip for 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 people is like when you re- when you study sesh or, or if you have a, a, even a small interest in 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 sesh murder nature is you go a long way if you just come in with a clean slate. Like um like if you're trying to find something, if you're trying to find Abraham <laughs> you know in Egyptian culture or you're trying to find Jesus or you're trying to find who knows what, you know, to tie it to to your to what you know or your culture or whatever it is you just you know you're gonna waste a lot of time and years you know so you just come in with a clean slate and just learn the lang- the language and the culture from a fresh perspective you know because that goes a long way like even i even coming into this i'm not even trying to focus uh, at this but like i said i'm not trying to focus to figure out how to connect this to my own uh, mother tongue or whatever i just want to learn the session on its own and then learn something else on its own and that's my approach with how i've learned languages and it goes a long way and then after that you have once you have the method and that system then you're good to go you will always be good and you'll always be working from you know from um you know a robust um foundation as opposed to just jumping in and be like i want to find this and i want to connect this to that and i want to connect the other to that everybody that i've seen does do that they, it's just pseudo all over and you see them three years four years down the line and they have not made one single improvement in in in, in their studies so just come in with a clean slate that would be my number one tip yes indeed so i picked up on um i was doing numbers yep What's that number? Isn't it, isn't it called numbers? Craft work numbers? Is it is that what it is? Numbers? Uh the song? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. E snee sen snee. Yeah, it'll get me started. All right. But yeah, so let's let the, you know, re- let the record and chat reflect. All right. So um, any, anybody else? Anything else? 
No. All righty. I guess that's it. Yeah, that's it. So we'll get cracking on Friday. <laughs> oh, is um Hassan still in the chat? Uh, who? Um, let me make sure I'm scrolling up, scrolling up. Yeah, Hassan and Yabwali or Willie. I'm probably butchering the last name. Forgive me. But he had a question. He said, what about uh, Legalis who compares Amharic with Medo Nature? Um, that's who I was actually talking about, who um, I believe that's what I was talking about. Yeah, I think he spelled the name a little different than what I remember. Um, who, who does that? And, and you know, they're, they're not successful at doing that. Okay, yeah, Hassan. So, Hassan, you had mentioned um, onomatopoeia earlier and so what that you know what that is is how um an object itself or some some type of object or or sound that something makes becomes its name in a nutshell that's what onomatopoeia is and so there is there is um that phenomenon in pretty much a lot of a lot of languages that are seeded language seed languages Okay, so you do have that going on. All right. So that that that, that does exist. Um, but it's not the case for, you know, obviously all the words and things like that. But onomatopoeia is something that is very, very primitive. That's very, very old, you know, where something will be described by the by the sounds that it makes or named based on the sounds that it makes. Okay, so yeah, you know, so that exists. So I don't I don't know. If that answered your earlier question, or I don't know if you were asking a question specifically about um, onomatopoeia and everything. So remember, acrophony or acrophonic principle is when you take the name of something and you take the first consonant of it um, and then utilize it as a character. So that's how a lot of... Um, some things are built off of. And like I gave the example of the owl, mulej, and that M is um, there for using the Rebus principle. The word for mouth is um, also similar. Okay, the word for mouth is ro in Coptic or ra, and that trill or that flap uh, sound that we call R is the mono literal um representation of that so so it becomes that sound in any word so you'll see an open mouth glyph used to represent that sound in any word that has nothing to do with a mouth but what you're looking at in the word is a mouth but it has nothing to do with a mouth and that's the rebus principle where you take a picture of something and detach it from its um what it represents and you and you use it for its sound its form so and i explain this you know in detail in other videos and basically if you if we understood if more of us understood what a word actually is and how it's it's two things that's connected by a third thing every word is a is a tr trinity um the rebus principle is a principle of separating that those two sides that are linked it's detaching the link where the two sides can be utilized independently and so for example a mouth glyph has the form of ra and, it, and on the meaning side you got form and meaning on the meaning side it is or the concept conceptualization is a mouth actual uh, mouth the organ that we have on our face the mouth but if you if you strip it the link, you could detach the concept of a mouth away from the form ra, and now you can actually use the form any which way you want. And that's the rebus principle, and that's how writing was given birth. Okay, so a writing system involves the rebus principle. It moves away from being pictorial in nature, where people say a picture is worth a thousand words. If pictures are worth a thousand it's each, if each picture is worth a thousand words then having a pictographic writing system 
would not be very useful because every picture could be one of a thousand words. That's not effective. It wouldn't be efficient at all. So they had to invent the visual representation of speech. And so that began the journey of the session matter natural writing system itself. All right. Where they have all these different principles. We call these things today. And obviously they didn't call, they wouldn't have known the, 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 the description being called the rebus principle or anything like that, but this is what they did. And it was very, very genius, very, very genius. All right. Very genius. Then there's a reason why they didn't use an alphabetic way because the, the monolithos are, are essentially enough glyphs to write out every word in the Egyptian language, but they didn't use it that way. Very, very genius. Um, what else? That's it. I'm beyond. I'm trying to actually know. Don't know what that is. Um, how prevalent is it in Ronnie Kimmet? I'm a, so Hassan, I'm addressing you, you, what you said, how prevalent is, I'm assuming you're saying Rodney Kimmet. Um, oh, on, on, um, onomatopoeia, it's, it, ex, it's there. Um, but not, and it's for any language. It's, it's there for, for like some, the basic vocabulary, like some basic vocabulary, you'll find it prevalent. But how prevalent is not prevalent, but it is there, it exists. All right. So just um, understand that. All right. And that's and that's for the things that can actually make sounds. Obviously, language consists of of the naming uh, or referring to objects that don't make uh, sounds or whatever the case is. OK, but the early, 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 early parts of of the language evolution of any particular language, you'll, you will definitely find onomatopoeia. And in fact, uh, Jean-Claude Mboli, in his book, he talks about language um, and how it can be traced back to to a very short list of onomatopoeic words or sounds all right i don't have um his book or information in front of me to actually list them but if you have his book or you know you're interested in that definitely get his book his book is is like man it's it's uh an invaluable tool and it's written in french though so if you don't know french it's going to be difficult but even if you don't know french get his book because the diagrams alone, you know, you don't, you, you know, you can look at the diagrams that he gives and, and have some kind of general idea because he, because he does a very good job at um, diagramming, you know, giving, giving figures and diagrams of the things he's explaining and walking through, because he's actually walked you through the process of historical comparative linguistics, starting with eight languages and then adding six more or starting with six, adding eight more or starting with eight and adding six more, but a total of 14 different languages through the process of historical comparative linguistics to actually show the genetic, linguistic genetic relationship between those 14 languages and the proximities, which in conclusion will turn the Greenberg classifications pretty much on their head. All right, he dispensed with all of that. All right, so there you have it. Um, that's it, Amy Cat, huh? Q, that's it. All right. All right, so um, yeah, we can close out. That's okay, get the book. Oh, that's it, huh? Okay, get the book. Oh, oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, dua. <laughs> I didn't know it was me closing out, but yeah, dua for, for everybody that's tuned in and those who are going to tune in later. And hey, make sure that you share the video and and um, 
you know, if you, you know, if you haven't joined the group page, do join the group page because, you know, there's a lot to learn there as well, you know, because here we are only here like um, twice a week lately uh, before it was, you know, much less, but on, in, the, in the Facebook group, we're always there and there's other people as well um, discussing the language, linguistics, all kinds of stuff that, you know, is good stuff to know. So make sure you, you know, you've joined the group so you can continue learn, learning in that, you know, and have that community around you. So yeah, that's all I would say in Dua. And hopefully, you know, everybody will be getting into the Havaric and simplified. But like uh, Ujau said, if you haven't, um, you know, done the, the, the formal search first, just take your time and get that, you know, under your belt first before you jump into the Havaric. But hopefully now you know that it's something that will not be as difficult as it is to get into when the time comes. Okay, I guess that's it. Mika, Chris, any last any last words? They are probably busy deciphering some other scripts. <laughs> But yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to say Shimon Hotep and see you all Friday, Freestyle Fridays. All right. So Shimon Hotep.